Hey guys welcome back to the channel this is story about what if Izuku has skin core part 1 before I start. Please do support for more amazing content and comments for part 2. Do consider to subscribe my channel and share my video to your friends and check out the description as well. Let's start the video. Izuku Midoriya. Something broken him at that moment. Something that would have been a long time coming if he were honest with himself. His mother had tried to sign him up for support groups, telling him to put his dream aside and start looking for one he could obtain. She had left to visit his father two weeks ago. Trying to save their marriage is how she put it. He was 16 he could manage. He had a bank account to draw from, the apartment and bills were paid for. He knew she wasn't going to come back. Her closet was relatively empty. His father, if you could call him that, just disappeared after his fifth birthday Izuku never heard from him again. He had sent him a birthday card, but it just come back returned to sender. He had no friends, no one cared about him. The only people who would care were the ones that would have to clean up his remains. His parents would probably sigh and then happily sell the apartment and his stuff and move on. No one cared the teachers didn't care the counselors didn't care. The only person that had shown anything was a girl with spiky black hair one time when he was seven. She had approached him after a particularly savage beating from the Kugo and his cronies and helped bandage him up. He never even got her name. He would dream about her sometimes, that she was his friend, but that all Izuku had were dreams. He stood on that rooftop for a few more minutes, just gazing up at the sky. The sun was retreating, bathing the sky in brilliant purple and oranges, before it started fading into black. The lights on the street began to light up like constellations in the sky. He longed to see the real stars, wishing he could see them over the light pollution and the clouds. He knelt, pulled the burned notebook out of his bag, and scrawled a note. Mom. Dad. Bye. He added his name, address, and phone number, so they can be notified more easily. He silently chuckled to himself. Not they would even care. He climbed up to the top of the fence and lowered himself down, his feet resting on the edge. Tears were beginning to flow. This one person why couldn't just one person reach out to me? I asked for help, begged for help, and prayed for help. Why couldn't my parents love me, support me? Why couldn't they say for once that they believed in me? No one is born equal, it's all a fucking crapshoot. I wish I could have done something. I wish I wish I wish I had at least gotten her name. Fuck my parents, fuck the schools, fuck the system, and fuck you, Bakugo. I hope I see you in my next life, and I will make you know what the hell you put me through. He turned, facing the fence, slowly spread his arms, and let it all go. He felt gravity take control, as he felt the wind, he was watching the sky for a moment, and saw the clouds break open, and he could see the stars. Thank you, he whispered. Before closing his eyes, the wind was all he could hear. Then there was intense, sudden pain for the briefest of seconds, darkness, sweet darkness. Then there was light everywhere, it was white, blinding, it was the purest white one could ever fathom. You are an interesting one, a sudden hollow voice rang out. How he managed, suddenly, he could feel his hands, feet, and everything. His skin was heating up slowly, and he noticed the heat, he tried to open his eyes, but couldn't, the heat was building, and he knew it. Where am I? Is this hell? He had heard about hell in movies as he was never a religious boy, even when he was sobbing on his hands and knees for a quirk. A small chuckle erupted around him from the voice. He couldn't tell where it was coming from or whether it was male or female. Where am I? Who are you? He managed as he gritted his teeth. The heat and pain were increasing, and his nose was beginning to be filled with the smell of burning hair. He fell to his knees as he felt his skin begin to burn slowly and painfully. His mind was flooded with images of his life, he saw the image of the girl from his dreams again. He screamed as his nervous system began to burn, his blood was boiling, his eyes were exploding against his eyelids, and his organs were melting. He screamed and screamed. Then it all stopped. Suddenly no pain, no heat, nothing. He felt nothing around him. He could feel his extremities, but they were light and weightless. He could feel himself almost floating in a bathtub. He opened his eyes to see himself looking down on the earth, seeing lights all over the planet, blinking on, some pulsing, some flickering, and some going out. What are those are those souls? The laughter returned this time, but it felt right next to him. He turned and saw something. It was like his mind could comprehend what he was looking at. Are you God? He managed, only greeted with more laughter, and he felt the heat coming from the direction of the earth. On the far side of the planet, he saw it, fire. It spread quickly, encompassing the whole of the earth. He saw some of the lights pulse brightly to form one light before they all disappeared, and there was no light, only the fire. Out of the fire rose a bird of flame, a phoenix. It let loose a great cry before rising from the planet and taking the fire with it, as it flew into the darkness of space. Izuka looked down at the broken husk of a world, feeling sadness from deep within. Before he knew it, the tears fell. He saw a single tear fall and strike the planet, then he saw it, a light appeared a pulsing light, then another, and then more. Come on come on, you can do it, he thought. He saw the lights grow and spread all over the earth, but then he saw the firebird coming from the stars again. 
the planet being burned, life beginning again, only to be burned out, repeatedly, twenty times in total. Then he saw the lights again. Some were burning brighter than any had seen. Then he saw a light spark, burn, flicker, and begin to fade. He focused in the light and saw himself. He saw himself jump and light burned out. He reached for the light, struggling to touch it, wanting to keep it from going out. No, you don't go out. Why? The voice asked. I don't know. I don't know, he sobbed. He didn't know why suddenly, he wanted to live, maybe it was looking down and watching his planet get destroyed twenty times over, watching the sparks form and grow, only to be snuffed out in the great fire. Over and over, he watched them struggle only to be cleansed. He could see it coming again, the phoenix was coming. He thought of the girl. He thought of her. I don't want her to die. I don't know her name, but she was the only one who seemed to care. I want her to have a chance. You would attempt to stop the phoenix. You would attempt to stop me. Izuku whirled around. There before him was the bird of flames. Yes, he said. He can't it rush through him, and he felt himself burn again as it touched down upon the world. No, why? Why do you do this twenty times? Why do you keep doing this? It has to be done. It needs to be purged. Maybe they will get it right in the next life. No, please stop, not now, please. What is it you are trying to accomplish? Evolution, advancement, they have come close, but they always falter, they stagnate. Hundreds of years, they have been given after the gift's rival. They have squandered it, wasted it. Now it must be purged. From its ashes, it will begin again. Maybe they will get it right this time. They just need someone to show them the way, bring about change, give them a chance. They need a chance. He pleaded. And who will show them, who will lead them, who will rise. I will just spare them please. How you don't have any gifts, remember. Remember, you don't have any more dreams, it said almost mockingly. I, I don't know, but I will find a way. Give me a chance, give us a chance. Perfect, it crewed. Ha. Huh. Suddenly there was fire again, and there was pain. Then it slowly subsided, and he felt like he was lying down, the floor was hard, but his head rested on the most sublime surface ever. His eyes fluttered open, and he looked down at him, the most beautiful woman he had ever seen. The most vibrant and brilliant head of red hair and green eyes, perfect pale skin. And he had his head in her lap. He was surprised in many ways. He didn't stutter, he didn't freak out. Who are you? Hello, Izuku, as she gently tucked some of her hair behind her ear. My name is Jean Grey. Izuku and Jean. Hello, he said, calm, almost cold. He knew somewhere inside his mind that he should be freaking out on many levels. He was lying on a girl's lap. A beautiful girl's lap. She had even done the hair tuck like his books. He couldn't talk to girls, hell, he couldn't talk to anyone. But why wasn't this bothering him so? Why was he so calm? Why couldn't he stand up or move or anything? Why was she so damn warm? Um why can't I move? And why am I not freaking out? And not to complain, why are you holding my head in your lap? She chuckled and gave him a dazzling smile that should have broken him, but instead, his emotions didn't flare up. 1. You can't move because we are not allowing you to. 2. You are not freaking out because your emotions are being dampened. 3. You had this image thousands of times, wishing to experience it once, so I gave it to you. We? Yes, Phoenix and I. Are you two different beings or people? Yes and no. I am, or was, a host for the Phoenix Force, one of his favorites. What you see here is an echo or a member of the person that was Jean Grey. Do you remember when you tried to look at the voice and your mind could not comprehend what you saw? Yes. That is the true visage of the phoenix, the firebird you saw is a physical manifestation of that shaped by reality when we entered. I am a way for us to talk in a way that your mind can understand. How can you expect a mortal mind to comprehend the infinite? So, what happens now? As of right now, your body is cocooned inside your home being rebuilt. His mind began to race in a small moment of panic before that soothing feeling started again. Why am I being rebuilt? You're dead, she said in a simple, matter-of-fact way. You threw yourself off a building. Yay, you're right so couldn't you just resurrect me? Smiling, yes, we could, but your body is not suited or ready for us. You wanted and dreamed of being a hero, but you did nothing to accomplish that goal except dream. No exercise, no training, nothing. Well, except analyze quirks like a madman. If he could have blushed, he would have. But no one believed in me. I didn't have a quirk. And? She replied coldly. You think just because you have a quirk that all of a sudden everything is easier. That they don't have to work hard to make it better to control it. Images began to flood Izuku's mind. He saw Bakugo exercising and practicing. A girl with green hair and a frog quirk running through a forest, jumping and using her tongue to lash out and hit flying targets her younger siblings were throwing around. Another girl with short brown hair floats around an abandoned building while touching objects, making them float and fall before she comes to the ground and throws up before beginning again. A boy, his face scarred with hair of white and half red, was sitting in a training room with ice all around, freezing the boy over, as he continued to push and push. 
the images of kids, teens, heroes, and even villains practicing and training, came faster before showing him his one-time favorite hero, All Might, in a gym, practicing and practicing for hours. The quirk is great, or it can be if you know how to use it and train how to control it properly. But are all the hero and villain fights you, see? Are they just using their quirks or running, fighting, or doing other things? He just lied there, and he knew she was right. Yes, he had been born quirkless, but he never did anything but wallow, and did not try to improve or better himself physically. You never fought back. You just let him beat you down repeatedly. You tried to jump in and save others sometimes, and then just let him beat you. If you are going to go down, go down swinging, for fuck's sake. You saw those lights gather to struggle against the flame of the phoenix, even if they knew it was hopeless, they still fought. Izuku wanted to cry. She was right. She was so damn right. He didn't do anything, didn't try to exercise, work out to get stronger, didn't try to join a dojo, or even watch videos online to try and learn how to fight. He would take his beatings as that was his lot in life. He was precisely what Bakugo had said he was, Deku. Bakugo had helped beat that into him, but Izuku had never tried to improve his lot. I never took any steps to do well jack shit. He was angry, he could feel the anger, it wasn't muted like his other emotions. Yea, he suffered, yea he was treated poorly, but he never did anything. No recording videos of the assault and taking them to the police. Nothing, just covering for that piece of shit Bakugo all the time to his mother. No wonder she is fucking left. Could she have done better? Yeah, but he did nothing to help himself. He suddenly paused, noticing the anger, and looked up at Jean. Why can I feel this but not the embarrassment of my head in your lap? Because I am blocking the emotions that will hinder this conversation. So, what now? What happens now? She smiled with the warmth of a mother looking down on her son for the first time. We are going to rebuild your body, I am going to train your mind, and you are going to rise from the ashes because you are the phoenix. Either you will lead this world to change or bring it down in the fires of rebirth. This world is on the brink, I know you can see some problems, but there is more out there. Your mind is brilliant in some regards, but we will train it. I was chosen to lead you down this path because I was a type of hero in my time, I fought to save the world, the galaxy, my friends, and my loved ones. I also made mistakes and destroyed an entire solar system. I failed more times than I could count, but I know that I made a difference in the end, and that is all that mattered. Izuku saw flashes, a school of other strange people with different quirks, fights, tears, death, rebirth, lovers lost, and lovers found. The world rages against her and her friends, and they fight to save them anyway. A world is hating them, loving them, and hunting them. They were driven to the brink of extinction only to rage back. Mistakes made, forgiveness taken for granted. Love. He felt love, familial love, love of friends, and love of the intimate sort. He looked up at Jean and saw as things began to overlap in her form, a young, scared girl, a strong confident woman, a leader, a wife, a lover, a hero, a mother, and a phoenix. Wow was all he could mutter as he gazed at her. He would wonder if this was love for a moment. But he knew it was something else. It was admiration for the struggles, the perseverance, the simple truth that this woman had gone to hell and back and kept fighting. She kept training and getting stronger till the end of her days. Never gave up. So, what happens now? Looking down at him as she lightly placed her fingertips on the sides of his temple. Now Izuku, she whispered somewhat seductively. This is really, really going to fucking hurt. His brain felt like it exploded. No, it was engulfed in fire. He screamed out once before it all went dark. Mei Hatsum. Mei Hatsum stepped onto the streets of Mustafa, exiting from Infinite Arcana Electronics with a small bag in her hand. She was bouncing in excitement to get this tiny bugger home. The latest processor is the Infinity X69. Usually, she would build her stuff with the scraps she would collect from Tacoba Beach and some other scrap sites she had found. But not today. Today was special. The mysterious Infinity was the absolute best. His tech was defiantly beyond everyone. She had saved for this little thing and would take it home to reverse engineer it and make her babies even better. Nothing was better than making babies. She couldn't wait to get home. Pausing, she looked up at the sky, wondering if she needed to grab an umbrella. She usually wouldn't bother but had to protect this piece of precious tech until she could disassemble it. Her quirk kicked in. She could tell there weren't storm clouds, so she was confident she would be safe. It was then, as she was zooming out, she saw it, or more importantly, she saw him. The boy with messy green hair had climbed the fence of the Aoi Rosa building. Hey, she screamed. Don't do it, don't jump. Help we need a hero or something people around her stared as she ran. Then she saw him drop a small smile on his face, and she screamed louder. Running across the road, she didn't notice how close she came to being isekai'd, thanks to Truk Kun. Darting down an alley to get to her target, she lost sight of him, frantically pulling out her phone and calling the police. As she burst from the alley, sure of the view, she was about to see only to see nothing. Nobody, no boy flying away, no hero swooping in to save, nothing but ash falling into a pile where the body should be. She stumbled across the street, narrowly avoiding traffic in her days. 
Reaching the bank, she pulled a vial from her pocket and scooped up a sample. As she examined it, she could tell it was ash, warm still. It took a moment until the sound from her phone and the emergency operator on the other end began to bring her back to reality. Never mind my mistake, she said as she hung up her phone. She looked at the sky above. Momoyeoi Rosa. Ms. Momoyeoi Rosa was sitting in the satellite building of a boardroom for her parents' company in Mustafa, listening to her father talk to someone named Sylvia from Infinite Arcana. Sylvia, as she was learning, was the CEO of Infinite Arcana. The two CEOs were finalizing a deal that would be a big boost to Yeoi Rosa Corporation. The corporation that her parents were grooming her to run. The corporation she didn't want to run. She had different ambitions, she wanted to be a hero. Her parents were not happy, she had managed to convince them to let her apply in a few years, if only that it would add a boost to the company and family, if their future head were also, in fact, a pro hero. After all, if your company is known for its support gear, what better advertisement could you get than the pro hero and CEO Creedy, using those very inventions to save lives? She knew her parents loved her, but she was the only heir. Her mother was forced to have a hysterectomy shortly after Momo was born. It was deemed a miracle that she was born in the first place. Difficult conception, difficult pregnancy, and incredibly difficult and dangerous labor. So, there was no second child to carry on the legacy. So, it was her responsibility. She knew her quirk was robust and versatile, being to create pretty much anything, as long as she knew the chemical composition was, to put it simply, extraordinary. This was how her family had risen to such great prestige. Her distant ancestor was said to have a similar quirk back when quirks first manifested. Now here was Momo expecting to carry on into the future. She wanted to help people. She wanted to save people. Be someone that people could look up to. She helped a boy in the park a long time ago after some bullies had beaten him up. She had happened upon the scene after the fact. All she had done was make some simple gauze and help the poor boy. But the look of gratitude he had given her cemented it at once. She wanted to be a hero. She never got his name. Momo was, in fact, lonely, she didn't have many friends. Well, real friends, she went to a prestigious academy for the rich. After learning an unbelievably valuable lesson in middle school about girls using her to increase their social status, and her first boyfriend being a shallow doubt whom she heard talking to his friends about how he was going to score with the rich girl. Puberty had hit her like a bomb, she was tall, curvaceous, with large breasts and great skin. It wasn't easy, to say the least. She sighed quietly and thought about calling her only true friend, Melissa, tomorrow. Melissa was an exchange student, and they had hit it off when Melissa had transferred to Momo's school for a semester. Melissa was quirkless and the only daughter of David Shield, the genius inventor for I Island. But she was brilliant, fearless, funny, and genuine. They had stayed connected and had even been to see each other a few times. She was lost in thought when suddenly, she saw a body fall through the windows. She screamed. Somebody just jumped off the roof. She stood bolting out of the office, leaving her father and Sylvia stunned for a minute. Her father quickly excused himself from the meeting allowing his secretary to reschedule. The guards outside were in a momentary shock, but soon chased after their young mistress as she shouted instructions. Reaching the stairs, she yanked them open and raced downstairs, discarding her heels. The guards began yelling into their radios while one followed the Momo, and the other ran to the roof. She hit the street in a burst from the side exit, bracing to see a body of some sort, but she saw nothing before she was a pink-haired girl with cross hair eyes standing near a pile of ash looking up at the sky. Did you see them, the person who jumped she yelled at the girl. She ran up to her, trying to get her attention as people on the street stopped and stared at the sight. The pink-haired girl turned to her, whatever days she was under seeming to disappear. Yay, I did. It was a boy. He had green hair. Then what happened? I don't know. I got here, and I didn't see anything, nobody, no one flying away, no heroes, nothing but this pile of ash where he should have landed. Momo looked down at the pile. She could feel the heat on her feet through her stockings, realizing she was barefoot. Security came dashing to her side. Her father and more security emerged from the main entrance looking around before he approached his daughter, demanding an explanation. As Momo was trying to explain, her father, while not saying anything, had a look of disbelief on his face. The pink-haired girl standing there turned and spoke. She is not lying, I saw it too. I was over there she pointed to the alley. I was on the street over, and I looked over and saw him fall. I even called the police. She is holding her phone up as evidence. When I got here, all I saw was this pile of ash, though, which is weird because it's not dissipating. And it's still warm. How could you have seen it from way over there, young miss, if you don't mind me asking, Momo's father said. The girl pointed to her eyes. That quick lets me see fine details like a super zoom function. I was looking at the sky to see if it would rain when I was zooming out, I saw him fall. A sudden wind wrapped around them, and the ash spiraled into the sky and dissipated. May noticed that it wasn't actually dissipating, but instead just disappearing. One of the security officers leaned in and whispered into Mr. Yeoi Rose's ear. 
Momo noticed he looked puzzled before asking the officer to have security start reviewing the footage immediately. Father, what happened? We should probably discuss this inside. He turned to the pink-haired girl. Miss. May turned to him and seemed to notice him for the first time. Oh my god, I am May Hatsum. Jumping forward very abruptly. You miss your yoi rosa. OMG, I don't have my babies with me fuck. She said loudly, grabbing her hair. Babies? Momo and her father exclaimed, looking around suddenly. I should run home and get them. You will love them, then you can hire me on the spot, no UA for me. UA? You're planning on going OUA as well? Momo asked. Are your baby's inventions? Yup, yup. Oh? Her father stepped forward. Miss Hatsune was it. This is not quite the time. But why don't we step inside, and we can set up an appointment for you later. They seemed to buy that logic and stepped inside. Momo leads her to the conference room, saying he will join them shortly. The inventor and the heirs. They followed Momo with a spring in her step into the elevator, reaching into her pocket and pulling out the vial with the ash. Momo took a moment to turn from the girl and make a new pair of shoes. May saw the glow and immediately pressed forward, invading the heiress's space. Holy cow, is it your quirk? You can make shoes. No, Momo stammered momentarily, not used to strangers invading her space like this. I can use the lipids in my body to create almost anything as long as I know the molecular structure. Are you fucking kidding me? Imagine what kind of babies I could make if I could do that. I would have endless materials. Hey, want to come back to my place and make babies? Momo felt a hot blush run through her for a second. Not tonight, Miss Hatsum. Visibly disappointed, May's shoulders shrunken momentarily before exploding out, May, call me May. Then how about? The elevator doors opened, and Momo was never so happy about such a thing before. Oh look, we have arrived, let's go to the conference room this girl was a whirlwind. Being so close and saying such crazy things without a care in the world. I wish I could be as free. Momo led May to the conference room. As they entered, May began wandering around, looking at the tech in the room. Momo was glad for a moment before finding her seat, however, her respite was short-lived, and May bounded over to the seat next to her, and pulled herself closer to Momo. Hey hey wait. What's your name? Momo realized she had forgotten to introduce herself, putting a slight distance between them so she could face the girl. She stood and gave a small bow. I'm very sorry Miss Hatsum. Just May works. Momo paused. My name is Momo Yoi Rosa. Hum. Yay, too much Momo or maybe Mo. No, Mo is too boyish. Momo, it is. Part of Momo was slightly offended by this sudden declaration to call her Momo or Mo. She barely knew this girl. Yoi Rosa works as well. Nope, too long. It's Momo. Oh, I should go. I need to get Revere Zengi I mean, go home and comb my hair. Yay, that's the ticket. Wait, May Momo couldn't let her leave yet. You haven't had a chance to schedule an appointment with my father yet. Damn it, you are right. Hey, what's your number? My number? Yay, your phone number so we can have you come over and make babies. She was like an overly excited puppy on caffeine and sugar. Before anything else could be said, the door swung open, and in walked her father with a few security members. One member slid a few forms in front of Momo and May. May, if you would be so kind as to fill out a statement for us. I don't want to. Well, then you are free to go, but I'm afraid I won't be able to make an appointment with my secretary, if that is your decision. May looked across the table at the man before scrunching up her nose, grabbing the paper and the offered pen. She started to scribble down her statement. Momo glanced at her father. Seeing him nod to her, she began to do the same. Did the cameras find anything? No. Momo knew he was lying. There had to be something as they finished the statements. Her father's secretary came in and made an appointment for May in two months. Her father had Momo escort May downstairs. As they were in the elevator, May kept trying to get Momo's number so they could make babies. With the elevator doors opened, May stepped out and turned to watch as the doors began to close. The ashes didn't dissipate. They disappeared. What? exclaimed Momo. The ashes disappeared. The Aoi Rosu. The elevator's doors closed, and it began its climb back to the conference room. When they opened, she saw her father's secretary. Before the woman could leave, Momo got May's number from her. Momo entered the conference room. What did the camera see? Her father turned to her and turned on the TV. She saw the screen come to life, and then it got fuzzy suddenly as the signal scrambled. After a brief moment, the camera shifted views, and it saw the door open, and the static followed the unknown person down the stairs and out of the building, the video feeds being disrupted the entire time. The camera shifted back to the roof. If what happened before it was even stranger now. The roof could be seen this time, but a person was standing there, but their entire upper body was distorted. All that could be seen were some generic school pants with red high tops. They saw a bag on the roof, it opened and dropped back down with a notebook sticking out. They saw the distorted image climb the fence and jump. Just as Momo was about to ask about the bag, they saw a portal open and a hand reach out and pull the bag into it before vanishing. What the hell is that? Momo spat out. This is insane. 
exactly. We are going to have main security come in. I already contacted the main branch, and we have some electronic specialists to review the footage and cameras. Her father exited the room signaling for Momo to follow him. Are you going to keep your appointment with Ms. Hatsum? No, her father responded, raising an eyebrow. I just did that to get her statement. I will surely hear if she's any good from the scouts. Why? Nothing father. I just wanted to ensure I followed the same train of thought. The girl. Now let's go home. The white hot room. Midori awoke in the white room, his head and body hurt. He wasn't lying on Jean's lap anymore. He was lying on the ground. He stood slowly as everything broke, but at least he wasn't burning. He was alone. He just stood there then the pain began to fade. He looked down at himself. He was naked holy shit, what is going on? Wait, where did all this muscle come from? He looked down, apparently, something else had increased. He felt a blush for a moment, but it wasn't as bad as he knew it should be. Where are my clothes, he wondered. Then a thought began to form in his head, and suddenly he had clothes. How did I do that? He pondered briefly, but he could feel the knowledge there. He could feel a lot of knowledge there. I knew you would catch on quickly. He spun and saw Jean, wearing a skin-tight white suit with golden boots and gloves with a stylized symbol of the phoenix on her chest. He found his eyes lingering over her body in a way that would have left him a sputtering mess. But instead, his mind just fired a mile a minute. The only outside tell was his pinky tapping rapidly. Jean smirked. Like what you see. Yay, he responded. Quickly he put both hands over his mouth. He was stunned for two reasons. He responded so swiftly but knew he meant it and was not ashamed of it. The second, his voice sounded deeper. More like a man than a boy. His voice was already changing, but there were still more cracks than he would like to say due to his nervousness. He pondered it, he could remember everything, the abuse, the neglect, the shame. He even thought about the Kugo for a moment. The Kugo, not Kachin. He thought about how he was treated, and there was anger and rage. No desire to gain acceptance from the Kugo. No need to be friends. Careful, Izuku, don't give in to the rage. But I want to hurt him so badly. I want to make him feel what he did to me. I want to break him he stood there. He could feel the rage. He felt fire erupt around him, a dark red fire with a black at the tips. Jean looked at him and raised her hand, and the fire disappeared. Midoriya was stunned. Where did the fire go? Why wasn't he burning? Jean smiled, placing her hand on his shoulder. You must be careful if your darker emotions take too much hold on you. Things will go bad very fast and very quickly. Midoriya's mind was filled with images of Jean filled with rage and the fires of the phoenix reaching and snuffing a star. Oh shit. Yes, exactly, I haven't released you yet. We will work on controlling your emotions and your powers. My powers? Yes, you may have some differences from me, but there are some that all members of the Phoenix share. Now tell me what they are. How would he start it, but he knew it. It was in his head, telepathy, telekinesis, pyrokinesis. He knew he had it. He knew he could control them. He knew that he could back them with the power of the Phoenix. The Phoenix. He could sense it. It was a part of him but also everywhere. A sense of the cosmic filled him. Powers, he was unaware, danced just out of his reach. She smiled. Can you feel the power of the phoenix on the edges of your mind? Yes. What is it? Power, you must discover yourself. The power that will help you with your mission. Before he could ask the question, he knew the answer. Jean had plunged knowledge into his head. Academics, battle tactics, how to fight, dodge, scientific knowledge, history, art, how to drive, all kinds of things. His mind hurt so much, and he was engulfed in fire. So I just need to learn to control my emotions. He asked as the fire and pain subsided. No, you need to understand and deal with them. If you only lock them away, you will explode and destroy everything. And you will need to learn your powers. You know them but not the practical experience. Knowledge of how to fight and the experience of doing so are two different things. So, how do I get the experience? A sadistic grin crossed her face. She spread her arms wide, the fire erupting around her, and lifted herself into the air. People began to materialize from behind her. He recognized them, her friends, allies, lovers, children, and enemies. I am going to beat it into you. He was scared, but something he didn't expect he was excited. Deku was dead. There was only the phoenix. The fire erupted around him. Bring it. May's workshop. May made it home after one of the more exciting days of her life. The other was when one of her babies had decided to explode for no reason that she could find, landing May in the hospital for a week. But today well, today was all kind of crazy. To a boy jumping off a roof, ashes disappearing, Mr. Yeoi Rosu lying to her, Momo was lovely though, and what was intriguing most right now was the ashes were still warm in her pocket the Infinity X-69 also, but not as much as these ashes. Yes, she knew that Mr. Yeoi Rosu was lying. She knew he was trying to get a statement when she started babbling about babies. Besides, he did not know her work. Large corporations had talent scouts for that kind of thing. The more important thing was putting her name in his head. Momo, on the other hand, was a slightly different story. 
The way she had burst onto the street minus shoes was rather interesting. She was far more concerned with the fact that someone had jumped, not that it was off of their building. While Mei didn't get along with most people due to her personality, she did want to help society at large. She enjoyed creating things, not only to help heroes, but she even made something for everyday people. While she would spout off about sponsors, contracts, and big money, that stuff was all nice. It was a means to an end. She needed all those people to get the material and research space, so she could do what she wanted, change the world. How to change the world was an unanswered question. But if she could make it safer and a little more comfortable for everyone, that would be a good start. Honestly, this was part of the reason she liked Infinity so much. He could charge much more for his processors and items, but they were incredibly affordable and durable. Yay, he was rich as fuck, but no one knew what he looked like. He didn't even graduate from UA. He was from England, he had graduated from the University of the Black Dragon, and they had no photo of him listed. But that was neither here nor there. She pulled the vial of ashes from her pocket and stared at them for a minute. She needed to have the proper tools to analyze them. But she could fix that. She chuckled. Now she had managed to catch Momo's interest enough, this might be easier. But if not, she could still do it on her own. Tomorrow she could start hitting the scrap yards to dig up supplies. But that was tomorrow May's problem. Tonight, May's concern was exploring all the wonders of the Infinity X-69. She began to drool and found heat to flutter stomach and lower even. I wonder if this is what it is like to be in love, she mused aloud. She felt like this every time she worked on her babies. That is why she called them that. The act of designing them. For play. Assembly. Sex. Hence making babies. She was worked up and ready to go. Sitting down at her workbench, she pulled the X-69 out of its bag. Oh, you sexy bitch, you are going to get it. Now show mom all your dirty secrets. We are going to do it all night. May was true to her word, and they went all night through the next three days. Till May passed out from lack of sleep, the X-69 was a naughty little minx, and would not give up all her secrets so quickly. May knew this would be the most significant case of edging in the history of ever. But oh, she couldn't wait. Returning to the castle. Momo Yeoi Rosa rode home in silence. She spoke with her mother briefly before heading to her room. Today was a day and a half. She stripped as she walked to her private bath. She sat and watched herself, replaying the surveillance video in her mind. There were so many questions. What happened to the video? Someone had some technology to disrupt the video, but the fact that it was mobile maybe it was some quirk. That was the obvious answer, though not the only answer. Then there was that weird distortion after the first. That one seems more obviously a quirk, but why only disrupt the top half? Well, it made it damn near impossible to identify them. How did what she could only assume the two people end up on the roof? One of them could fly. The second one could, as the first just walked away. But if the second could fly, why did he scale the fence? She knew that there were immense pressures out there. Japan still had some very high suicide rates, especially among any quirkless that were born there. Out of the worldwide population, about 20% were quirkless, but in Japan, where the first quirk was ever recorded, that was more like 2%. In a nation where a quirk was used to judge so much and impacted your life, not having one was close to amounting to exile. She knew Melissa had suffered some hardships, but she had her father and I island. Her mind was far too brilliant to be ignored. And she grew up in a safe spot for such a thing. She would have to call Melissa tomorrow and tell her about the whirlwind that had been the last few hours. Then there was May. That girl was complicated. She would invade personal space, but then there were moments when she was quiet. The comment about the ashes not dissipating but disappearing. What did that mean? She wanted to reach out to the girl. She could use the pretense of being interested in making babies such an odd phrase. There was a lot to unpack. Momo let her mind wander before exiting the bath, going through her nightly rituals, lotions, creams, combing her hair, slipping into a comfortable pair of silk pajamas, and reading a chapter or two of her encyclopedias. Tomorrow will be another day. Izuku was lying on his back, bleeding, and sure his ribs were broken. He looked up at the silver man holding his surfboard, of all things, and the stupidly tall being behind him. The being spoke its voice hollow and full of power, is that all you have, little phoenix? My herald barely used a fraction of his power. Izuku swore under his breath as white flames erupted around him, healing his injuries. I swear I will beat the herald's ass, take his surfboard and shove it up this plant-eating bastard's ass. You kidding, you big stupid bastard. I'm just getting started the battle started again. Melissa Shield. Melissa Shield was pleased to receive a call from her bestest friend Momo, not so much after she heard about her friend's night. However, she did get a good giggle out of me. She and Momo were close. They had even shared a kiss. It was more for Melissa as she fell down about who would ever want to kiss a quirkless loser like her. It was nice, but it lacked a spark. So, it went as far as that. She did love Momo, but she had realized it was not that kind of love. She told Momo to get her a video copy, and Momo promised she would. It took a few days for, but Momo secured a copy of the surveillance video. 
She was on a video chat with Momo after her friend sent her an encrypted copy of the video. Melissa was only stunned at the first part. She was surprised at what she had seen. The first part troubled her as she was damn near positive that her father's tech caused the first disruption. But that tech was not to be off the island. She told Momo that she would have to let her father know if there was some unknown break in her espionage. Momo wanted to protest, but she understood. Melissa told her she would run an analysis on the video and talk to her father, and that she would speak to Momo after school tomorrow. Melissa paused to ask Momo why she wasn't leaving this to the security company. Honestly, Melissa, something is bothering me. I need to know if that kid was murdered or mind controlled into jumping off the roof, and what May said is bothering me. The ash was still hot when I got down to the street. And her comment about it disappearing, not dissipating. I can't let this go. I don't know why. Melissa smiled at her friend. That's good enough for me, Momo. I'll talk to you tomorrow. The chat disconnected. Melissa set the video to run through a program she had invented and left to track down her father. It took her a good 30 minutes to finally find him. He was concerned when she insisted on talking to him privately. Melissa activated the room security before telling her father what Momo had said and showing him the video. Melissa noted that David was shocked and more interested in seeing the second half, but not so much at the first. Is it your tech dad? Yes, dear, it is. I gave a version to a dear friend of mine. I need to contact him and ensure this was him, or if not, we have a large problem. Okay, I understand Melissa knew that her dad wasn't about to say anything further about this mystery person running around with her dad's tech. You will let me know if it was your friend so I can ease Momo's mind. Yes, dear, I will. Please let me know what your analyses show up. Of course, with that, Melissa left. When his daughter exited the room, he immediately contacted his friend. All might. Hello David, nice to hear from you. Why yes, I am in Yusutafu. Yes, I do believe that I was on top of Yoi Rosa Tower. Was someone with me? Yes, David, how do you know all this where you jumped? David, I have to go, yes, I understand. I will call you back. Do you think that I can be a hero too? No? He tried to overcorrect his mistake by mentioning the police, but he knew the damage was done. He noticed a pain in the boy's eyes. He didn't even make sure the boy was okay. The worst part was that it took him a minute to remember the boy's name, Izuku Midoriya. He immediately dialed a number on his phone. Hello Namasa, sorry to bother you. Please look into something very quickly, it's important. Was there any report of someone jumping off the Yeoi Rozu Tower in Yusutafu on Monday evening? Second, I need the home address for Izuku Midoriya, the same prefecture. Yes, I'm sorry old friend, I need it now. Yes, I will wait. He sat in silence. After talking to the boy, he had been walking the streets, making his way home, when an explosion caught his attention, and the sludge villain he had dealt with earlier in the day was loose again. He must have dropped the bottle when he was flying with the boy. He delayed his action, but that's when he saw a student from UA Mirio Tagata run out and save Bakugo. Yes, that was his name. Mirio was having some issues but seeing his heroics inspired All Might, spurring him into action. He smoothed Mirio's problems with the heroes that were scolding him and trouble with UA, a talk with young Bakugo about showing proper gratitude. Then he had left. He had started looking into Mirio using Nezu, the principal of UA. It had even led to him talking with his one-time psychic, Nidai. It turned out Mirio caught Nidai's attention, and he was about to come to All Might about Mirio being his successor. No yes Namasa I am still here. No report, huh? Just a 911 call that was cut short. Can you follow up on that for me? No, I will explain over dinner Sunday. Yes, please send that info over. The call ended a short, while later there was a beep with the info he wanted. He was glad there was no report, so maybe David was mistaken, but he had mentioned the video. He would have to look at that later, but first, he had to check on the young man. And apologize for his harsh words. He walked out to his truck and drove to the boy's home. After the short drive, he exited and went up to the apartment. Not a bad neighborhood, but not the greatest all might noted. What he needed to prepare for was the woman that opened the door. Jean Grey. Standing there was a beautiful red-headed woman in her early twenties, American, with green eyes, smooth pale skin, relatively tiny green shorts, bare legs, and a very form-fitting black tank top with the words burn, looking to be written in fire across her noticeable chest. All Might was used to encountering rather beautiful women in the hero business. He was friends with Midnight. But something about this woman screamed life, vibrancy, sex, she was fire, and he was a moth. All his years of hero training kicked in before he spoke. Hello, miss, my name is Tashinori Yagi, and I apologize for dropping in so unexpectedly. I was looking for Izuku Midoriya. Is this his home? Yes, but I'm sorry Izuku can't come to the door right now. He is very sick. He caught a terrible cold a few days ago. I'm a friend of the family visiting from America, so I am taking care of him till he feels better. How do you know him? And what brings you by so suddenly? Of course miss. Gray. 
and is grey. You see, I bumped into young Midoriya a few days ago, and I'm afraid I may have said something that injured the young man, and it has been heavy on my mind, so I wanted to come apologize to him. Oh, you are the asshole that told him he couldn't be a hero, right? All Might was taken back. Why yes Ms. Grey, I wanted to come by, and apologize for that. Well, I will let him know. But you can just fuck right off. Now, Ms. Grey, I know I was harsh, but I don't think. Jean cut him off. That's true you didn't think, now Mr. Yagi was it. I don't care, Izuku is very important to me, and you heard him. I will pass your message, and if you have a card, I will let him decide if he wants to call you. But other than that, I would rather you remove yourself from the doorway, and give your platitudes to someone who might give a shit. She held out her hand, and All Might handed over one of his cards. Before he could say anything, the door was closed in his face. He turned and made his way back downstairs. Well, that could have gone better. I hope he calls so I can apologize. In the apartment, Jean burned the card in her hand before disappearing. Izuku was breathing hard and bleeding. How the fuck was this short hairy guy with claws giving him so much damn trouble? He had defeated an eater of worlds, and now this guy was giving him all sorts of difficulty. Well, bub, you going to stand there and bleed or come get some? He was going to pluck every piece of hair off this bastard. Momo. Momo was glad to hear from Melissa that it was, in fact, her father's tech, so that was some relief for the first part of the video. The problem was that her dad would need to provide details on who that person was. The only reassurance was that they were a friend of her father. Melissa's program had been running for a week, and still couldn't make heads or tails of the distortion on the second part. Nothing was cleaning up the image. Her company needed more success too. So here was Momo sitting in her room at the end of another week of school. Having had to deal with three confessions and one attempted serenade at her gates. She was looking at her phone and chewing on her thumb, a single thought came to mind, Mei Hatsum. Taking a breath, she fired off a text. Momo. Hey Mei, this is Momo Yeoi I wanted to know if you wanted to get together tomorrow, I would like to see some of your inventions. Mei. Momo. Oh, Momo, tomorrow is fine, come over whenever we can make some babies together. The user has sent their location. Momo. I am unsure about making babies, but I would like to meet with you nonetheless. Mei. Sure, tomorrow is fine. Momo sighed, which had gone easier than she was expecting. Her parents were flying to America to meet Sylvia from Infinite Arcana, so that no one could stop her. David Shield. Meanwhile, on I Island, Melissa's computer had finished running its program, but I did not alert Melissa. It instead alerted David, her father. David was awakened by the sound of his alert message going off. He grabbed his phone and was stunned for a moment. Cosmic radiation detected. He sat up quickly, rubbing the sleep from his eyes. Oh, shit. He immediately pulled up the report and began to read it. This is the video that Melissa was analyzing for that Momo girl. He immediately activated the security in his room with a button. And he pulled a separate phone from a secret compartment on the nightstand next to his bed, dialing the only number in the phone. Hello Mr. Freedom. We have a problem. Cosmic radiation has been detected. Yes, sir, from a video that was recorded in Musatafu. Yes, sir. I am aware. I will send the file right away. No, sir. No, sir. No one else knows. Yes, I will make sure. Hanging up the phone, David was sweating. An Omega-level threat had made contact on Earth. And his daughter and her friend were trying to chase it down. Veronica. The beautiful woman's voice responded from the ceiling. Yes, David. Full containment protocol. Please give me all messages between my daughter and her friend Momo Yeoi Rozu for the last two weeks. Falsify her scan on the video. Alert infinity. And give me all the feeds you can around Yeoi Rozu Tower Musatafu. Track and correlate with All Might's blue unit. Send a message to King as well. Yes David. Messages are ready for viewing. False report sent. Feeds will be ready in one hour. Infinity and King have been alerted. Thank you Veronica. Continue monitoring Melissa and alert me to any conversations. Yes, David, then artificial intelligence went silent. The inventor and the heirs. May was staring at the reading from her ashes sample. What the hell is the radiation signature? I have never seen anything like this. I could dive into the international database. Momo. Hello May, I am outside. May looked at her phone and skipped to the door to let Momo in. Hello May, I brought you some cookies. Cool, come on in, let's make some babies, as she shoved a cookie in her mouth. This is good, as crumbs fell everywhere. Momo blushed slightly as May approached the gate to let her in, wearing overalls with no top or bra. May, maybe you should put on a top. Why? Yours are bigger than mine, we are girls with the same equipment. Momo just sighed and entered the workshop. It was dirty, and burnt metal smelled in the air. There were scorch marks everywhere several, I mean several empty fire extinguishers. So, why are you here if you're not here to make babies? May said with no hint of playfulness. Momo's head snapped to attention at May's sudden shift in tone. She looked at the girl with her overalls hanging down and slipped a red tank top on. I just thought I would come over to see your inventions. 
You know, for your meeting with my father so I could give you some pointers. You mean for the meeting that's not going to happen? What makes you say that? Momo managed to respond with just the smallest of cracks to her voice. 1. There's no way in hell the CEO of Yeoi Rosa Corporation would meet with some unknown inventor. He wanted to get me inside so I could fill out that statement. Nice non-disclosure hidden there at the bottom, by the way. You are here for another reason. Momo was taken back slightly. This girl was no joke. There was no pulling the wool over her eyes. Momo sighed. Yes, May, you were right. I'm not here for that. It's what you said about the ashes. I apologize for trying to mislead you. If you like, I can show myself out. Fuck no. Look, you'll take over the company someday, right? That's the plan. Then I can just show off to you. But first, I want to make a deal. What is it that you want? I need you to make some materials. I have been trying to analyze those ashes and know what I need. I don't have the right equipment to do it, and I can't salvage what I need, so that's where you come in. You help me, I share my results, and when you take over, if I have impressed you enough, you hire me, and I get to make the greatest babies the world has ever seen. Momo thought about it. It was essentially what Momo wanted, aside from supplying the materials part. Fine, but tell me what you use the materials for. And if I disagree with their purpose, I am not obligated to supply them. That works. Now, what do you need and why? May began to lay out her plans for the spectrometer she would need to continue analyzing the ashes. She showed Momo her notes and what she come across so far, including the strange radiation readings and the fact that they were still radiating heat. Also, she would need a better microscope because, despite a quirk, she couldn't get in deep enough to see the ashes on a cellular level. She also needs some material to upgrade her computers, because trying to run the analysis also killed those. Momo thought about it. Then she pulled out her phone and gave orders to someone for massive amounts of food. What's that about? As I told you, I use the lipids in my body to make things. Some of the things you are asking for are complicated to make, so I will need food if we do this. Oh, yay, Momo, let's make some babies. They started going over May's notes more in depth about the ashes and bouncing ideas off one another, as Momo began to make some of the simpler components for May. Momo had to ask, however. What did you mean that they didn't dissipate the disappeared? May thought for a moment. When something dissipated, I could see its breakdown, but the ashes simply blinked like a spark going out. It was small, but I could see it. Have you seen it since? No, but I have been cautious to contain the ashes. I have only lost about 20% in testing so far. It's not a big sample, so I want to ensure I have the right stuff this time. The two talked as the food arrived, then things went into overdrive, making material while May started working and assembling the needed equipment. It was long and tiresome work. They still need to get 10% done today. Momo agreed to come by on Sunday. This continued for the next few weeks. Eventually, they had all they needed. Momo had introduced May to Melissa, and those two hit it off like crazy. Soon they had a group text and everything. Momo had covered with her mom by telling her how she had hit off with May, and was essentially scouting her for the company in the future. The time had finally come. It has been almost a month since the whole incident started. With Melissa remoting in, they began firing up the tests and were all excited. The radiation that this stuff was giving off was entirely off the spectrum. It was new, and they had discovered it. Then they saw the sample begin to fade and disappear, they saw it blink out, May had been right. It was more akin to the flicker of a flame. The final test took almost a week to run, it would have taken longer if they hadn't hooked up the supercomputer on Eye Island, there was some DNA sequence in the ashes. The girls were giddy with all this could mean. Momo decided to take May out to celebrate, as the final test still needed to be run. Momo was relatively happy. She felt she was making a new friend. May was excited about something other than making babies. Maybe this friend thing was alright, and Melissa was fantastic. May couldn't wait to meet Melissa and all the babies they could make. She was giddy. They had a nice dinner. Momo had a car pick her up, while May had decided to walk home, since they were only a few blocks away. When she approached her home, she saw the gate open and immediately knew something was wrong. She ran to the gate and could see the workshop garage open. Everything was gone. Everything the computers, the gadgets, the notes, the links, everything. Her apartment had been tossed. Everything had just disappeared. Almost like a fire consumed it. Momo hit the door and went for the laptop to check over the files that Melissa and May had sent, and it was all gone the video, everything. Melissa accessed the mainframe and tried to check on the DNA sequencing, only to find the program wasn't running, and no sample was found, she studied, and all the files were gone. The video, everything, and her email showed no communication between her and Momo or May regarding the subject. The girls called each other. It took them a moment to calm down and hear everything from the other. May was almost distraught. It would take her months to figure out everything that was gone. Melissa was terrified that someone had managed to hack into Eye Island. Momo was upset, but then an unsettling thought crossed her mind. What if it was an inside job, Melissa? What do you mean no one else knew what we were doing? Are you sure? Responded May. 
Yes, I am positive. But you told your dad, added Momo. I did, but why would he? I bet you it had something to do with the radiation, Mei said. All three girls were silent. Mei broke the silence. Look, I got to go, I have to clean up and figure out everything missing. If these jackbooted thugs think this will slow me down, they don't know Mei Hatsum. I'll be by when I can help, added Momo. Maybe I can figure something out on my end, but I should probably go if it were an inside job, then we have no idea who might be listening. The three girls all hung up, and a sense of dread crept over them that they were being watched. Mei Hatsum began the process of cleaning everything. It was several hours into the process that she noticed something. Everything taken so far was installed with Infinity X69, even the reversed engineering ones. A oh, fuck that, she seethed. Izuku stood on the battlefield of his mind. Vanquished foes littered all around him. But the fuck is next? The portal opened before him and out stepped a tall man with purple skin and strange armor. He held up a gloved hand with strange stones embedded in it. With a snap of his fingers, hundreds of portals opened everywhere, spewing strange creatures onto the battlefield. I'm next, boy. Though, for fuck's sake. The first official meeting. May, Momo, and Melissa were all sitting at a cafe in town. Melissa was in town with her father. She held out some unusual looking phones to the girls. Okay, I got these all set up. Nothing is foolproof, but we should be able to talk on them without getting easily hacked. The other two took them and slipped them into their pockets. They had been trying to figure out things for months. Melissa figured out that whoever had accessed the mainframe was defiantly smarter than her, and it had to be an inside job. She had talked to her dad, and she knew. She just knew he had lied to her face. Something in the pit of her stomach told her something wasn't right. A hacker was found on the island and arrested. Momo had the same experience with her father when she told him someone had hacked her laptop. Make a file a police report, but no one was ever caught and charged. Her parents offered to have her relocate to be closer to them in Tokyo, but she declined. Citing she was closer to UA this way and was making connections. She upgraded her security with the help of Momo providing materials where she could. Through this, all the girls had become great friends, and now with the new phones, they could talk more freely. They would use their regular phones to keep up appearances when they wanted to talk nonsense. They started talking about where they would be applying next year, and they all agreed on UA even Melissa was on board. She needed to get out of her father's shadow, and even more, it hurt her that she couldn't trust him. She knew he would fight her on this, but she was more determined than ever. May and Melissa would apply for the support course and Momo for the hero course. Once Momo and Melissa were out from under their parents, they vowed to discover what was happening. Till then, they would try to enjoy each other's company. They were all happy to have found each other and to have friends. Izuku sat in the white room, meditating. He slowly opened his eyes and was met face to face with Jean. Are you ready? I don't think I can learn anything else in here. How much time has passed on the outside? Six months. Shit, have I been kicked out of school yet? No, I took care of it. How? Um, hello, Phoenix, remember? Izuku chuckled. Is my body ready? Yup, just finished putting on the spinning rims and installing the sound system. Well, let us kick the tires and light the fire. In a nondescript apartment in Musatafu. The cocoon began to flake away, being slowly consumed by fire. As it faded out stepped a young man. Not a boy but a man. He was 6'3 and had a fantastic build that was brought in a good way, not like a muscle freak, but enough that his shoulders tapered nicely into his waist. His muscles were cut and defined even without flexing friendly tone to his legs. And well, he was proportionate. His long green hair was no longer this curly mop on his head, instead, it was straight with a slight curl down to the small of his back. He felt a light flush to his cheeks, the room's coolness, his feet touching the floor. He took a deep breath, the air was familiar, almost comforting. He took a few minutes just standing there and breathing. The world felt new. He was new. No longer Deku. He was the phoenix. So are you going to stand there free bowling it or put on some clothes stud muffin? Izuku turned around quickly, seeing Jean. He almost covered himself, but then he realized that she had seen him naked tons of times during training, and she had been the one to sculpt this body. That thought gave him a slight blush that he could push away. He looked at her and realized he could see through her that she wasn't there. Did you think I would leave all alone? Truthfully, I hope you wouldn't, but I figured it would be on me. Oh, it is. And I hate to tell you this, but soon I will leave you. This is your journey. You can always find me though in the white room. I'm just here to guide you a little. She would leave. He knew that, but he was glad that she was around for now. At least she was the closest thing he had to a friend. I highly doubt that any of my clothes will fit. Jean chuckled and pointed to piles of Amazon boxes in the living room. I got you. Besides, I saw your wardrobe, and yucks. Hey, I had a style of a sort. A shirt that says the shirt is not a style, you know. What day is it? Why, it's July 15th, happy birthday Izuku. He smiled and went to the kitchen as Jean telepathically filled in what had happened for the last six months. All Might had come by, and Jean had told him off. 
She had called the school and taken control of a doctor to get a note sent to the school excusing his absence as he rehabbed from an accident. She had responded to some emails his parents had sent. They had half-heartedly asked if they needed to come home and help him. She dealt with them. She showed him that Yue was going to be instituting a dorm system. So when he got in, he wouldn't have to come back here again. There was also a scholarship program they could try and get into, so he could just tell them to fuck off. He liked that thought. He was thinking when his phone rang, and sure as shit, it was his mother. She told him that she was deciding to make her visit with his father permanent. They needed to be together. She also told him that once he turned 18, they would sell the apartment, so he needed to prepare to make his way. He could tell she was shocked when he responded with a figured as much. Thanks for letting me stay till I am 18. He would ensure that everything was in order in a year, as long as he received a small percentage. His father came on the line and said he would give him a small portion of the sale, but they were done. Izuku set deal and hung up the phone. That went according to plan. What to do now? Checking that it was, in fact, a Saturday, he figured he would get everything unpacked, clean up some, and head out. Monday, he would go to school and test out so he wouldn't have to return. With any luck, he wouldn't have to see Bakugo again. That should be fun. Izuku. Holy cow, that is a lot of Amazon boxes. How did you afford all this stuff, Jean? I didn't, your parents did. Remember that allowance and stuff. We didn't have to buy food for six months, and I also used your allowance. I could have just let you wander around naked. I'm sure Mrs. Yao would have enjoyed it before falling over from a heart attack. She is 80, after all. Yay, giving old ladies heart attacks is not exactly what I had in mind for changing the world. So you said you were here to guide me for a little bit. What did you mean? Izuku was opening boxes and sorting clothes. He glanced over toward her. Emotions. I am here to help you navigate emotion. Um. Hate to tell you this I'm an empath. No shit. Then great, my work is done. Drop me a line in the room every once in a while. No, wait. Gotcha. That was fucked up. But that is what I was talking about. The panic, the way your heart raced, everything. Her clothes vanished, and she stood in a sexy green lace thong and bra set with matching stockings. He felt his body react instantly, he had to stop himself from acting inappropriately. It was so bad that he called upon his empathy to control himself. She winked at him, and he had to redouble his efforts. That Izuku is what I am talking about. Her clothes changed again to a nice pair of jeans and a t-shirt. You are the phoenix now. Well I was able to train you in the white room on how to fight, tactics, feed you knowledge, and situational training, it's the emotional aspect that has to be experienced or if not. His mind was filled with Jean in a dark red version of her phoenix outfit, and the destruction of a star. With your connection to the phoenix force, your emotions are heightened to an extent, so your immediate reaction is beyond what you would typically have done. Well lust is a powerful trooper, you must be wary of anger. Izuku had compassed himself somewhat. The image made him shudder. As the phoenix, we are a representation of life itself. Of rebirth. Of change. We feel emotion very strongly. Love, lust, and anger. It can overwhelm us. Leading to great and terrible things. She continued. If you do not learn how to control your reaction, you might destroy the city the first time you see Bakugo. And before you say shit, no, using empathy to push it down is not an option. I bottled stuff up inside, which fucked up my life in many ways. So, you might shrink now. Essentially, her clothing shifted to a white blouse with too many buttons undone, a leather skirt, fishnet stockings, and high heels. Her hair was pulled back in a tight bun. So, Mr. Midoriya, let's talk about your parents. He didn't know whether to beg her to step on him or what. This is going to be so much fun, she giggled. Now, sit on the couch now her voice was stern, yet had a lustful tone. He quickly sat down, doing his best to suppress the growing tent in his pants. He was staring at her legs when he heard it ding like a bell go off above his head, and in glowing fiery green letters, new kink unlocked. That's it. He just died. As he hung his head in his hands, he heard Jean laughing. The rest of the morning went on well. He was able to work while he and Jean talked. They did it more telepathically so they could cover more ground. The speed of thought worked out better. Izuku had known he was angry. But shit, he was furious. He was a bomb ready to explode. His parents, Bakugo, the other kids at school, society, the teachers, shit, there was enough anger there to say, fuck it come on, Pookie, let's burn this motherfucker down. The only thing that had held Izuku in check was two things. One is his sense of right and desire to be a hero. Two, his inferiority complex. Now there were new problems, he wanted to be a hero, but things were different. Problem two was no longer a problem. They got down to the hard work of dealing with that. They had progressed as he sealed up the last of his clothes and packed the memorabilia in his room. No more All Might worship. He just couldn't anymore. It was more complicated than he thought. It's hard when you have someone on such a high pedestal, and they fall off. He only kept one figurine a limited edition Silver Age. What are you going to do with all that stuff? 
Well, all the clothes that are still in good shape. I am going to walk down to the orphanage. The memorabilia I'll take down the collectible shop and sell. Some of this stuff is worth much cash. With that, he gathered up one of the large boxes of clothes and two of the stuff to sell and went outside. Momo, May and Melissa. They had just finished their meal at the cafe, and after a brief debate on pain, Momo won by setting down the credit card faster than her friends could pull out money. Melissa put up more of an argument than May. They left the cafe catching stares and looks from the boys. The fearless trio had approached them, but as soon as the small one with hair resembling purple orb spoke any chance, they crashed and burned like the Hindenburg. How disgusting and rude can one person be? Momo said as they walked away. I give them credit for coming up and talking, but that's all, Melissa added. They said, all I heard was the little one say boobies. Those we do have in spades. Melissa giggled. Melissa. Momo gasped. Oh, come on, Momo. May and I have nice racks, but those things you're rocking are on another level. They things are huge. May giggled. How is it even possible? Fighting a blush from her cheeks, Momo took a few steps in front of her friends. Turning, she puffed out her sizable chest some. Milt does a body good. Melissa and May were shocked into silence for a few moments before absolutely bursting into laughter, soon joined by Momo. She turned to walk away and bumped into a wall. Well, not a real one but a wall of a man. It threw her off balance as she tumbled to the side. Well, this is what I get for goofing around, she thought. Melissa and May could barely get the word Momo out as she stumbled. Izuku. The outside was breathtaking. After spending what felt like years in a white room, the scent filling his nose, the sun on his face, it was terrific. He loved it. So new. He made his first stop of the day at the collector's shop. The owner didn't even recognize him. Which he was okay with. He got a great price on his stuff. They had increased in value. He picked up the box to take to the orphanage and exited onto the street. He needs to get some food after this. Jean was floating around him as they continued their session while he was out. Milt does a body good. Followed by peals of laughter. The laughter caught his attention. It was warm, rich, and most assuredly female. Jean giggled telepathically. Then someone bumped into him as he was glancing into a shop window. Izuku spun around and quickly caught the girl in a dip. He held her there momentarily, gazing into a gorgeous set of onyx black eyes. Something deep inside him sang out as their eyes locked, it was as if his soul was singing. Momo. One second she was falling, and the next, she was held in strong arms. She looked up at the person that had caught her. Brilliant emerald green eyes gazed down at her. Long green hair done in a single braid hung over his shoulder. The afternoon sun backlit him. As her eyes focused, she could see the strong jawline, the muscles in his arm, and his hand on the small of her back. She had placed her hand to steady herself on his chest, and she could feel the rippling muscles. It was like one of the books she had hidden under her bed. Her heart thumped against her chest, she drew a deep breath causing her bosom to heave. A heat started in her core and was spreading. She could feel his heart rate increase through her fingertips. His breath was warm. Her mind raced. Were they about to kiss? She wanted to be kissed by him. This being in his arms gave the sense of life, of fire. Izuku, he said. Momo. Hey buddy, you can put her down now. She hated May in that instant. Her mind snapped back to where she was. In the middle street in an embrace. The blush rushed into her face instantly, and an eep escaped her lips. He set her back on her feet. Her friends rushed to her side. Are you okay? Melissa asked. She looked over to her friends, telling them, yes. She turned back to the man. I am so sorry, I wasn't looking where I was going. No, it's quite alright. You can bump into me anytime. He smiled. Its warmth and dazzling nature caused her blush to increase, if possible. He extended his hand to her. It is my pleasure to meet you, Izuku Midoriya. She took his hand. Momoye Rosu. He turned and introduced himself to May and Melissa. Damn, he is hot, both of the girls thought. Are you okay, Yoi Rosu? Yes, Midoriya, she responded, tucking a piece of hair behind her ear. Her blush and that single action set his heartbeat into overdrive, the sun's rays framed her perfectly. Well then, sorry for disrupting you and your friend's day. He gave them a slight bow and moved to walk away as he passed them. Momo wanted to reach out and grab his arm, she didn't, but she wanted to. Her friends were checking on her as she watched him move away, then he suddenly stopped. And she turned back to them. Excuse me, Mizioi Rosu. Their eyes were locked on each other. I don't know what you and your friends are doing today, and please forgive me for being so forward with all of you. But I have to run an errand, but would you like to grab something to eat after? May and Melissa were shocked. Did he ask her out? I'm sorry, Midoriya, we just ate. That's alright. He set the box down and pulled out a receipt from his pocket and a pen. If you would like, please call me if you would like to get lunch another time. Once again, forgive my forwardness, but I know I would kick myself if I didn't say anything. May, Melissa, it was nice to meet you as well. She accepted the slip of paper as he retrieved his box and continued walking down the street. What the hell just happened? exclaimed May and Melissa. Izuku. Smooth Casanova. 
Jean giggled. Shut up. But damn, Jean, you weren't kidding. I just looked into her eyes, and wow. Just wow. Mei and Melissa are pretty, but Momo is hot. Holy shit. I hope she calls. I know Zuku, I know. He continued down the road. He went to turn and caught a glimpse of her and her friends turning down further up the block. The girls. So, Momo, what was that? Melissa said teasingly. I don't know what you are talking about. So, the rabbit breathing, the eyes dilating, Mei asked. Momo remembered her friend's quirk. I don't know, but it was breathtaking, she said almost without thinking. Melissa giggled. Breathtaking, huh? Momo blushed furiously as her friends began to laugh, which she joined in. So, you are you going to call him? If not, I wouldn't mind giving him the call. He could help me make something in my shop. Did you see those muscles? Hot Dan. There was this vibrancy around him. May said. If I weren't going to be leaving tomorrow, I would as well. He just seemed alive, like you said. May vibrant, Melissa added. May? Melissa. Momo looked down for a second at the phone number still in her hand. I saw him first, she whispered. Unmarked vehicle. Subjects are moving to a secondary location after an encounter with an unknown male, which appears random. Subjects are giggling and talking about boys. Agent 1 sighed into the recording device. How did we pull this assignment again? Who knows? Let's do this and get out of here. I am sitting here watching three girls about as old as my daughter, and it is grossing me out. Responded Agent 2. Izuku. He exited the orphanage and made his way back towards the restaurants. He waved at the house matron, telling her he would be by again tomorrow with some more clothes, to which they expressed gratitude. His telepathic conversation had not ended this entire time. It deviated course after his encounter with Momo and her friends, but shifted from anger to lust and love. It was a point being driven home by Jean that he couldn't ignore his desires or emotions, but how to manage them. That anger and rage had their moments just as love and compassion. Lust most definitely had a place, but he had to make sure he wasn't running around all day, just trying to get his dick wet. She understood that sometimes you needed to get laid, especially in a profession where tomorrow could be your last. Upon entering a cafe and taking his seat, he was poring over the menu as he was getting accustomed to girls paying him attention. It was excellent, he had to admit. The waitress flirted with him and even gave him a free order of fries. Girls in another booth would look over at him and giggle. He was absorbed in his meal and talking with Jean when a knock on the window got his attention. She was tall, a little older, with a great figure still, but it was the ash blonde hair and sharp teeth. That was Mitsuki Bakugo. Fuck me. Mitsuki. Mitsuki was out shopping when her stomach rumble pulled her away from the clothing store. She had just picked up a new outfit for herself and some jeans for her brat of a kid. As she went down the street, she was looking for a place to grab food. She saw this green-haired hunk eating in a cafe by the window. The color caught her attention, the green looked like her friend Inko. Inko had recently left town to live with her husband in the US. She had essentially abandoned her son Izuku here in town. Her brat once had been friends with Izuku, but that was a long time ago. All her brat would say is, Deku this or Deku that. It took her a few months to figure out that Deku was Izuku. Inko had tired of dealing with Izuku and all his hero nonsense, because Izuku was corkless. And had said fuck this, and left. Mitsuki was pretty upset with her friend. A few months ago, she had heard from the brat that Deku was in some accident. Mitsuki had gone to check on Izuku a few times, but his nurse had told her once he was asleep, or the second time he was at the doctor getting a checkup. When she asked Inko about it, she brushed it off as having talked to the doctor, and everything was fine. Her friend was acting so different. Raising Izuku had been rough for her Mitsuki, but Inko never encouraged Izuku to do anything. Mitsuki had inspired the brat too much. Now she wanted to slap the shit out of him more often. Then she saw that guy sitting there. She walked up to the glass, trying to get a good look at him. There was no way this was Izuku, the height, the hair, the muscles. She was sure she was wrong till she noticed the hint of the freckles. She knew it was him. And she knocked on the glass. Izuku and Mitsuki. Mitsuki stood next to the booth looking down at Izuku as he was wiping his mouth and moving to stand up. Holy shit, Izuku, is it you? Hey Auntie Mitsu. My nurse told me you came by. Just now, actually. I was going to give you a call tomorrow and thank you. They embraced in a warm hug, Mitsuki was so surprised by the muscles, height, and heat coming off him. Masaru kept himself in shape, but something other than this. Bad Mitsuki is Inko's son, her not so little son, but damn. Jesus, kid, when did you sprout and all this she motioned with her hand over his frame. They took a seat as the waitress brought over a menu for Mitsuki. Izuku sat back down. Well, I had a kind of spiritual kick to the head and realized that I need to help myself because no one will do it. So I got in shape, sadly, I got into an accident leaving the gym and was in recovery for a while. But all the sleep and getting some proper nutrition. I hit a growth spurt. That's more than a spurt, kid. Yes, auntie, I know, flashing her his dazzling smile. Mitsuki was caught off guard by the smile. It gave her a quiver that was highly inappropriate. 
You know, kid, the girls are not ready for you. That's the plan, a sneak attack like a lion, roar, he laughed. Or cougar, added Jean. Misuki laughed. She placed her order before switching to ant mode, and asked him how he felt physically and mentally. She was stunned when the boy answered her not with platitudes, but with open honesty. Anger with his parents and himself, and life in general. She could see his eyes shining with fire as he spoke. He told her of the phone call he had today with his parents. Mitsuki wanted to yell at her friend, but she just listened. She saw the resolve Izuku had. They cut ties with him, he was ready to do the same. He was mad, but he also understood that while most of the burden lay with him, he had a little himself. He didn't brush off her platitudes but accepted them. Soon they were laughing and smiling. She did notice he never brought up the brat at all. She didn't either. They went to pay, and Mitsuki insisted as it was his birthday. He showed surprise as he had never mentioned it. The waiter slipped Izuku her phone number, which gave Mitsuki a good chuckle. They talked in front of the cafe briefly before going their separate ways. Mitsuki may have enjoyed the hug a little too much, but a warm sensation spread in her gut when he kissed her cheek and thanked her for brightening her day. Charmer, she said and playfully punched him in the arm. She watched him walk away and sighed to her herself. I will call Inko and give her a piece of my mind later. And that kid is going to break all kinds of hearts. As Izuku began his journey to the market, after all, there was no food in the house. Jean started to tease him that there was no better revenge than telling the person he hated most. Hey, I fucked your mom. No, Jean, Auntie may have done a shitty job with Bakugo, but she never did that to me. But, Izuku. Remember, revenge has a place in time. The innocent have no place in it. He exited the grocery store when a buzz from his pocket got his attention. Momo. Hello Midoriya, this is Momo Yoi Rosa. Would you still like to have lunch sometime? I admit I was surprised by your invitation to lunch today. But I have to agree with you. I would be upset if I didn't respond and accept your offer. Izuku. If we are speaking honestly. If I didn't do what I did, I would have spent all the time I could wandering the streets in hopes of seeing you again, so I could ask you to lunch. Momo. Well, I am glad you took the action you did. Is there somewhere, in particular, you would like to go to lunch? Izuku. How about you pick the place? We met a few hours ago, so I would like to go somewhere you are comfortable. Anywhere you choose will be just fine. Momo. That is very generous, Izuku. How about the Cafe Divine in Musatafu? Izuku. Divine. How about tomorrow at 12? Momo. Yes, tomorrow at 12 would be divine. Izuku. See you tomorrow then. I enjoyed your pun. Momo. I enjoyed yours as well. Izuku slipped his phone back into his pocket and continued the walk home, and Jean danced around him, teasing him mercilessly. Simply amazing. I was reborn today. I meet a girl. I found my purpose. This is truly a rebirth. On the other side of town, two girls were teasing her friend, looking at her phone at the exchange. Momo just fell to her side, chewing on her thumb. He had come out of nowhere like a hero in her books, and whispered his name to her. He never took his eyes away from hers. Didn't stare at her body or anything. He then had just asked her out then and there. Now she had a date. What was she going to do? She had a date. Izuku. True to Jean's word, he didn't need sleep, it allowed them to continue talking most of the night. They took breaks from their continued therapy sensations throughout the night. He found out that he was going to need hobbies. Due to the nature of the phoenix, stagnation was not an option. He had enjoyed sketching for his hero journals, so for the time being, that would work. He spent the night looking up requirements for UA, researching things for a driving permit, and looking over jobs in the area. He would need to lay in some money before entering UA as he would need more financial backing. He then started reading up on all the hero news he had missed. Villain activity was on the rise, All Might was spending much time around Musatafu, he noticed, he still appeared around Japan, but his lack of appearances was not going unnoticed by the villain community. As the sun was rising, he went for a run as he passed the trash beach to Kobe. He saw an elderly couple picking up small pieces of trash and placing them in a bag, he slowed his run and approached them, as the woman seemed to be having an issue picking up something. Hi, I hope I'm not interrupting anything, but did you need help? He asked. Oh, thank you, young man, this thing is heavy and sharp. I see kids sometimes playing around here, and I don't want them to cut themselves. Izuka looked at what she was talking about, and he saw a jagged piece of metal sticking out of the sand. He lifted it out, placing it as best he could in the trash can. This speech used to be so nice. I brought her here on our first date, this is where I proposed and where she told me she was pregnant. The husband sighed. It's just sad. I wish we could see it clean one more time. But thank you for listening to the ramblings of an old man. The old couple smiled and moved off on their walk. Jean popped in next to him, smiling. Project. Project. He finished his run and returned home, taking a long shower and getting ready for his date. Momo yeo rosu. Those eyes. Those lips. Momo. She woke up looking around her room, it was a disaster area. Drinks and snack wrappers were everywhere. 
Melissa was asleep next to her peacefully. Mei was sprawled out, half on the bed and half on the floor. How does she even sleep like that? She exited the bed and slipped into the bathroom to wash her face and teeth. As she emerged, Melissa and Mei were beginning to stir. Morning, girls. She got a few mumbled mornings the Mei shot up and exclaimed. It's day day. Momo blushed for a moment. Well, let's get some breakfast, then you can help me prepare. Izuku Midoriya. Those eyes. Those lips. Infinite Arcana. Infinity rolled out his lab hammock and stretched his arms above his head. As he moved through the lab, it started to come to life. Lights turned on, coffee brewed, and various machines sprang to life. He walked over to the collection of devices sprawled all over the workspace. Mei Hatsum. Brilliant engineer. Amazing mind. She has a chance to do something great. Well, if this ball keeps spinning, that is. He walked over and grabbed his first cup of coffee. How any new radiation readings? No infinity. The sample is continuing to deteriorate. It is projected to be exhausted in two weeks. Infinity walked over to where the remaining ash sample was contained. Cosmic radiation. The only time this was recorded was 300 years ago when quirks manifested. This reading wasn't the same, so this might have been a different entity. If the first contact brought the world quirks, what would the second contact bring? The door to the lab opened. He could tell by the clack of the high heels who it was. Slender defined arms slipped around his neck. A kiss was lightly placed on his neck. You didn't come to bed again. Sorry about that, my love. I had an idea and started chasing it. Did it pan out? No, sadly. Well, wait to get started on anything the AOI Rosa will be here at noon for the garden party. And you need a shower. He chuckled, kissing her hand. Yes, dear, let me set some things up to start running, and I will see you upstairs. Twenty minutes, and she left. He glanced over his shoulder as she exited the lab before returning to the ashes. Now are you going to tell me your secrets or not? Momo. She was ready, okay, she should change her shoes. She was about to do so when Melissa and May stopped her. As they exited the room, several maids were standing at the ready. With a nod from Momo, they entered the room and began the cleanup process. Thirty-seven outfits later, Momo wore a red sundress with black patterning around the skirt. The neckline was pleasant and appropriate, but she did an excellent job framing her bust, it was easy. Black sandals with straps wrapping around her calves, red lipstick, light makeup, fresh paint on her nails and toes, and a matching clutch. She was as ready as she could be. May had made a fuss over making Momo choose sexy undergarments, but they had reached a compromise. Three vehicles were waiting for the young women as they exited the front doors. May was returning home. Melissa had to meet up with her father as they left this afternoon. And the third was for Momo. Hugs and kisses were exchanged, with Momo promising to call and share details, as the two girls departed. Her heart fluttered. One thought crossed her mind as she entered the car those lips. Izuku. He was a duck on the pond. Calm on the surface, but his little feet were going a mile a minute. A teasing, giggling redeed was not helping. Well, she was but still. He stood in front of the mirror dressed in black slacks and a dark green button-down shirt with the sleeves rolled up, hair braided and smooth, and he was adjusting a watch that Jean had bought him. The watch was lovely, gold with a white pearl face. When he asked, he only got that a girl has her ways. Should I buy her flowers? Is it a bit much? Most girls love flowers, and it would show that you are interested. Thanks Jean. He pulled out his phone and found a flower shop near the cafe, when he received a notification that his ride share was outside. He spritzed some cologne and did a final check in the mirror, last pat down, keys. Check, wallet. Check, phone. In hand. Let us get this show on the road. Upstate New York. Boro and Ashaye Rose sat in the back of the limo as they were heading to a garden party. They were reviewing notes they had prepared as some rather influential American and European businessmen, and their wives were expected to be there. We should have brought Momo, Gore said. No, Melissa was coming to town. You know that she would have been heartbroken. Still, it would have been a good opportunity for her to make some connections. True, but she has what four more years. Let us not take everything from her just yet. You're right. Did you see the correspondence that arrived? Yes, Dominic Freedom would like to arrange a meeting between his son and our daughter. An endeavor has reached out about arranging a marriage for her and his youngest Shoto. Boro, we are already taking her dream away. Do we want to force her into an arranged marriage as well? Ashai, I just want what's best for her. But I understand what you are saying. Maybe we can at least introduce them to each other and see if it happens naturally. Ashai was about to answer her husband when her phone drew her attention. We might not want to wait too long, Goro, she turned her phone to show their daughter, obviously dressed for a date stepping into a car. I'll start making the arrangement when we get home. Should we call and ask her whom she is meeting? No, dear, she is nervous enough. Someone asked her out, and she said yes. Let her enjoy this. Yes, dear. Izuku. He exited the rideshare, using his phone, he made his way over to the flower shop, after consulting with the owner, he walked out with a lovely bouquet of tulips and roses. He made his way over to Café Divine. 
He was a little early but entered and got a table by the window. The hostess smiled at him and winked, wishing him luck. He ordered water as he waited. Izuku, I am here at the cafe. I am seated at the fourth booth near the window. Momo, thank you for letting me know, I am five minutes away. He sat calming himself when he saw a car pull up in front of the cafe, and the driver opened the door and out she stepped. His heart froze, and the world stopped. He could hear Jean laugh. I am in so much trouble. Momo. She did her best to steady her nerves as they pulled to a stop. Emerging from the vehicle, she thanked the driver and entered the cafe. As greeted by the hostess, she looked over to the fourth booth and saw him. He was getting his feet. He looked like a Greek god. The rays of light filtered through the window, his muscles were visible under his shirt, a button undone, and were those flowers. She walked towards him. Izuku. She glided towards him. This goddess swept into the cafe and was now coming to him. For all that exists in the universe, don't fuck this up, Izuku. She was smiling. Did she just do the hair tuck? Do girls practice that? Fuck me. He smiled at her and extended the bouquet. Yoi Rosu, you look stunning. I am sure there are better words, but honestly, I cannot recall them. She blushed. And that smile. Thank you, Midoriya, that is very sweet. Thank you as well for the flowers. She said as she took her seat. He motioned to the hostess for some menus and took a seat. They sat silently, blushing and looking up through her long eyelashes at him. He was just lost in her eyes. Everything around was fading away only her. Momo. Is anyone else even here? I can't stop looking at him. I should say something. But I don't want to. I could spend forever looking at him. Her mind began to flood with images from all those hidden books. Him slipping off his clothes, softly undressing her as he hovered above her, coming in ever closer to his lips so near hers. The cough snapped them out of their trance. What in the world is wrong with me? Um, just water for now. Thank you. Café Divine. The waitress had snapped them out of daydreams. I took the two of them a moment. Finally, Izuku spoke. I'm sorry I was staring at Yoi Rosu. And again, I know this is so forward of me, but you are magnificent. Momo, she said quietly. Please call me Momo. Izuku. Silence. He took a deep breath. I have never been here before. Is there something you recommend? He said, lifting the menu, giving them something else to focus on a much needed distraction. Oh, yes, the Da Hong Pao tea is amazing. As well as is the house chicken. They looked over the menu, they were looking at each other again. The waitress returned, ordered the tea, and both ordered the chicken. Breathe, just breathe, get to know her. Jean told him. He took a breath. Okay, how about we do this? She looked at him quizzically. Hi, my name is Izuku Midoriya. I am 17 years old as of yesterday. I just recovered from an accident. I go to Aldera High and plan to go to Yue. She smiled that smile. He is breaking the ice. Hello Izuku Midoriya, I am Momo Yeoi Rosu, I will turn 17 in under a month. The two girls you met yesterday are my best friends, Mei Hatsum and Melissa Shields. I attend Hine Academy, and I also plan to go to Yue. Hero Course. Yes, Hero Course. Wow, that is awesome. If you don't mind me asking, what is your quirk? It took off from there, she could create things from the lipids in her body, as long as she knew the molecular structure. He was what he called a psychokinetic. He could move items like telekinesis, but he could also affect things tiny, causing a fire he could control. They were both single children. Her parents worked a lot, his father worked abroad, and his mother joined him. He liked to draw, she liked music, art, and reading. They weren't fans of horror, he liked old music, pre-court things. She enjoyed the classics but was a fan of a new band called The Sound of Fury. He thought they were terrific also, so talented and diverse. She wanted to be a hero to help others and improve the world. He wanted to be a hero to save people and institute change. Both of their favorite school subjects were history. She enjoyed science and math. Math was never his strong suit, but he had been improving recently. He said the accident had been a blessing, as it forced him to reevaluate his life. He had had a breakthrough with his quirk. She felt a little sad that he had to rehab all alone. They ate, talked more, and shared dessert. Drank more tea. They spoke of the bill and settled on her paying for the tea and him for the food. She loved the flowers. They took a walk to a nearby park and kept talking. The longer they walked, the less they spoke, and the more they looked at each other. He told her there was an art exhibit in the next town over, could he take her there next weekend? They agreed on a second date as the sun began to dip in the sky. She had to head home, she told him, she had class tomorrow. He asked her if it was wrong that he didn't want the date to end. She told him no, but all good things come to an end. He walked her to the park exit, where they waited for her driver. They were standing there simply gazing into each other's eyes. He asked to kiss her. She said yes. It was soft. The fiber ignited between them. It became more intense, her arms around his neck, his wrapped around her waist. Slowly their mouths opened, their tongues exploring each other till it was a fiery embrace. She slowly pulled away as her driver arrived. They were both breathless. Wow, they said. Please let me know when you make it home, Momo. 
I will, Izuku. She turned his head slightly, kissing him on the cheek, not trusting herself with anything more. She got in the car and drove away. He was giddy and felt light. Six months ago, he jumped, and now he was the phoenix. He had kissed a girl. The most beautiful girl in creation. With the power of creation. He walked out of the park down the street, calling his rideshare. Are all first kisses like that, Jean? Nope, ones like those are special, trust me. Good. He went to sleep that night. He wanted to dream. Dream of her. He was rewarded. Momo. She was silent the entire time home, she entered the home, went straight to her room, and closed the door. Her hand went to her lips. She could still feel the warmth. She placed the flowers in a vase next to her bed. She took a seat and pulled out her phone. Momo. I am home Izuku. Izuku. I'm glad you made it home safe. Izuku. Did you have a good time? Momo. Yes. She sent a photo of the flowers. Momo. They're next to my bed, so I can see them when I wake up. Good night Izuku. Izuku. Good night Momo. Can I call you tomorrow night around 8? Momo. I would like that. Talk to you tomorrow. She momentarily held her phone against her chest, and then turned to the group chat. Momo. He was terrific. He was so handsome. We have a lot in common. He wants to be a hero, also. He kissed me. I enjoyed it. Her phone practically exploded with the responses from her friends. They texted for hours as she gave them all the details. She bathed and did her nightly routine, but pulled a book from under her bed to read before falling asleep. Eldar hi. Izuku stood in front of the school for a moment. He could hear all the whispers around him. Most students didn't recognize him, the boys were jealous of his physique. The girls were undressing him with their eyes. It was pissing him off, he was trying to control it. Everyone here had either bullied him or stood by while it happened. Not one of the motherfuckers had lifted a finger for him. It was then that he suddenly felt the fire. He stopped it. He remembered what Jean had taught him. She wasn't with him this morning. She had promised to step in if it got bad. But this was his journey, and he had to do it himself. Deep breath. Let's get this shit over with. Please don't let me run into him today if there's any justice. He was stuck in the office for well over an hour. Talking to the principal and guidance counselor, they were having difficulty adjusting to his new appearance. After getting somewhat frustrated, he used his telepathy to give them a nudge to go with it. He got his counselor to agree to allow him to take tests and graduate early. That would be handled by the end of the week. But he had to attend school for the week. After a short trip to the nurse's office to review his medical release, he was told to participate in class. He paused at the door, and he could hear it. All you fucking extras, just shut up. I will be the only one from this shithole that goes to you, eh? There is no justice anymore. He opened the door the class went silent. He walked over to his teacher and handed him his pass. Ah, Mr. Midoriya, welcome back, fill this out, please. College selection sheet. He wrote Yue on it, signed it, and left it at the podium. A single sound had yet to be made. Yue ha, well, good luck with that. The teacher said, not looking up. Who the fuck is this guy? Now, class, behave while I go turn these in. Whispers all around the class. Is that Deku? Holy shit, what happened to Midoriya? What the fuck is going on? Dude, dude, pinch me. I think I am asleep. He didn't respond, just taking his seat. Holy fuck is it you, Deku? How many steroids are you doing? They shrink your nuts, but you never had them. He heard Bakugo say. He didn't respond just breath. Hey, you quickless piece of shit, you answer me when I talk to you, or do I need to remind you of your place? Are you listening to me, Deku? You fucking answer me. Explosions started to sound out in the room. The other students began to back up. Hello Deku, Deku, are you deaf as well as quirkless? That is not my name, Izuku said through his teeth. What the fuck did you just say? Huh? Izuku stood up and turned around, finding himself towering over Bakugo. I said that's not my name Bakugo. Either call me Midoriya or shut the fuck up. The room fell silent. Whispers. Oh, shit, did you hear what Deku said? Oh, you think you're tough shit now, Deku, let me remind you of your place. There was an explosion. But nothing happened. When the other kids opened their eyes, Bakugo extended his hand, but the explosion and smoke were all contained in a field of green energy. Izuku had a similar power covering his body. What the fuck you KHH? The energy encapsulating Bakugo slid around his arms, pinned them behind him, and bound his legs. Izuku's arm snapped out, grabbing Bakugo by the throat and lifting him off the ground. Listen here, you homicidal psychopath, I told you my name is Midoriya, actually, I rather if you just never spoke to me again, Bakugo tried to speak, but the hand around his throat got tighter. I'm sorry, what was that? I can't hear you. You really must speak up. Mr. Midoriya, release Bakugo at once and go to the principal's office. The teacher ordered, entering the room. Izuku dropped him, gasping for breath, how the fuck you asked. Midoriya leaned down, grabbed him under the chin, and leaned close. I took your advice. I jumped. Remember what I said, pumpkin. He released Bakugo's chin and gave him a light tap on the cheek. Mr. Midoriya. 
I hurt you. I'm going. Everyone was stunned. The Kugo was stunned. He looked over as Izuku walked out of the room. No fucking way. There is no fucking way. What did he mean he jumped? Embarrass me, you fucking piece of shit, Deku. You were never quirkless, you were just fucking with me. Looking down on me, you damn Deku, then you and your drugs make you think you are stronger than me. In a stranger than Kinjik's explosion murder. You will pay you fucking Deku. The guidance counselor and the principal agreed that he could just come in on Saturday to take the tests. He walked out, flipping the school off as he walked away. God, that felt so damn good. I wanted to fucking kill him. He started shaking, he ducked into an alley. The shaking was getting worse. Some small pieces of paper started catching fire. Arms suddenly wrapped around his shoulders. It's okay, Izuku. It is okay. Let it out, no one will see us or hear you but me. He did just that. The world almost burned that day. It wasn't the first time, nor would it be the last. Jean kept him company all the way home, her arm around his shoulder. How close? He said. Minutes, maybe seconds. Emotions suck ass. Thanks for being there. That's my job. Izuku, you must realize that just because we talked all day wouldn't make it simple. I know. I was riding the high from my date with Momo. Oh shit, I have to see if we can go to the exhibit on Sunday since I have to take those exams on Saturday. Quickly he sent her a text. Izuku. Sorry to bother you while you are at school, but I wanted to see if it was okay if we went to the exhibit on Sunday. I had something come up for Saturday. I hope you are having a good day at school. He wasn't expecting an immediate reply as he knew that she was in school herself. Jean suggested he head down and update his quirk registry, since they had a free day. So, he did just that, late bloomer, yada, yada, telepathic push to do it already. He then felt terrible, his lousy mood caused him to take someone's free will, even for a moment. A villain or, more precisely, an enemy would be one thing. That person was us doing their job. He offered a silent apology to the universe. He went and updated his identification, that was a chore and a half. He was very proud he didn't use telepathy to smooth things over. It just took most of his day. Not really, he was getting home around the time he would if he left school. He would have a free week, he could get some stuff accomplished. His thoughts were pulled away when his phone chimed. Momo? Yes, that would be fine. I hope it is nothing serious. Is there anything I can do to help? I am sorry I did not answer you sooner, as I just left class. Izuku. No need to apologize. I knew you were in class when I messaged. I should be fine. I have to take a test at school on Saturday. I am taking my finals so I can graduate early. Momo. That's awesome, Izuku do you want help studying? Izuku. That would be nice. What day works for you? Momo. Tomorrow or Thursday would be best. How about Thursday? Izuku. Sounds excellent. Where would you like to meet? Momo. I know an excellent library. Would that work? User has sent a location. Izuku. That sounds great. Thank you. Momo. See you Thursday. Izuku. See you Thursday. You know you don't need help, Jean added. I could always use some, but I can see her sooner this way. He returned to researching how to donate a dumpster for his cleanup project. The next few days passed quickly, Izuku spent the next few days working out and doing his therapy sessions. He packed his book bag, ensured that looked appropriate, and went to the library. He found Momo waiting out front in her school uniform. He took a mental picture, she noticed him approaching and smiled. He walked over to her, she seemed unsure how to greet him. He gave her a light hug and kissed her cheek. Thank you for doing this for me, Momo. She returned his kiss on the cheek. It is my pleasure. She responded, feeling that tug and warmth from him again. She just wanted to be held in his arm and kiss him, even a kiss on her cheek sent tingles through her body. They entered the library, found a nice place in the back, and started reviewing his notes. They spoke quietly, their hands finding each other under the table. He could feel her breath on his cheek. Her scent started filling his nose. Soon their lips touched, the fire igniting and engulfing their minds. They stopped attempting to study then, soon, she straddled his lap as their tongues wrestled for dominance. Her hands tangled in his hair, his hands on her hips, soon, he broke and began to kiss her neck. She pulled him close, doing her best to stifle her moans. She could feel the reaction from his member, she gasped, feeling a press against her. She started to grind her hips against him. They broke apart for a second, their faces red, their bodies hot. She whispered. We should stop. She managed, her body crying out for more, an almost irresistible pull calling them. We should. She returned to her seat. They took a moment to compose themselves. Dinner. He asked. Dinner. They exited her, hugging onto his arm, making Momo lead the way down the street. Black fan. They seem close. Rather quickly, but you know teenagers, hormones. They don't look like teenagers. Dude fucking really. I'm joking. No, you weren't. I island. David Shield was poring over the reports. The radiation, the scrambled video, everything. The cosmic being as they were called, had touched down on the planet. And now they were missing. 
What was terrible was that his daughter was involved in this. Well adjacent to. Now she was talking about all the CUA nonsense and suddenly wanting to leave for college. He didn't like it. She would be 18 and he couldn't legally stop her. He could say he wouldn't pay but she would have access to her trust at that point. He turned his attention back to the task. The modified satellites were sweeping all of Japan. There had been a cosmic flare Monday morning but it was so brief they couldn't get a satellite in position and when the ground crews moved in they found nothing. Yue. He read the report. He was excited. So very excited. The game was afoot. And if there was anything Nezu loved more than tea, it was a game. Izuku. Friday was a good day, thanks to talking with Momo over dinner the previous night, he secured the funds for the dumpsters to clean the beach. They texted most of the evening before she told him to get a good night's sleep for his tests the next day. He left the house early Saturday morning to ensure he was on time for class. He was flipping through his flashcards when someone caught his attention. A frail skeletal looking man was leaning against a truck. Hello young Midoriya. It seems you have more than recovered from your illness. Midoriya sighed. I am busy at the moment. Is there something, in particular, you want at all might? I was wondering if you would care to explain this, he motioned to Izuku's new form. Or this. He was holding a copy of Izuku's quirk registration. None of your business, how's that, Izuku said, his anger bubbling beneath the surface. Six months ago, you were a tiny, frail boy who told me he was quirkless, now here you are, a strapping young man, and you have. He paused and looked at the paper. Psychokinesis. Izuku ignored the man and started walking down the street, he was stopped when All Might touched his shoulder. Don't fucking touch me. Izuku growled at the hero. You will explain yourself. All Might demanded. I will do no such thing. I owe you no explanation. Jean told me you came by in two quarter, you can go fuck yourself. Midoriya bit back. No, listen here, young Midoriya, All Might responded, stepping closer. If you don't remove your hand Izuku's voice dropped a little lower as anger crept into his voice. What will you do? His eyes narrowed. This, he said. Oh, my fucking god, it's All Might, holy cow All Might is here. All Might stepped back as doors started to open. Izuku smirked and kept going down the street as people exited their apartments. I thought you were about to fight him, Jean telepathically told him. I thought about it. He was annoying me. But that would be counterproductive to my day. And besides, no matter the outcome, I will miss my date tomorrow. That's a great thing to say. Hey Momo, I have to cancel our date because I am on my way to Tartarus because I decided to fight All Might. Well, as far as excuses for blowing off a date, that would be one to remember. Elder. He got to the school, making his way to his testing area. The exams began promptly, and Izuku managed them just fine as he was being watched for signs of cheating. He smiled as a few questions were ones he and Momo had gone over. It was a long day. Each test was graded as he finished. He had to wait for an hour for the last one. He reached out telepathically, scanning the surface thoughts of the teachers. Principal, well. That professor, he scored at least 98 on everything. And that was math, his worst subject. Japanese professor, he was always brilliant. Too bad he was corkless. History professor, look, he passed. Let us just let him go. The Kuga will be happier, and you heard what happened last time he was here. English professor, yes, send the Deku on his way. Principal, that is just mean. Izuku pulled his mind back. Fuck this place. He pushed out farther. Aw, oh, fuck, really all might is outside. The principal came back into the room. Well, Mr. Midoriya, you passed with flying colors. Here is a copy for your records. Are you planning to return for the graduation? No, just mail it. Well, good luck in your future endeavors. Thanks, but who would want that from a Deku? The principal was still as Izuku left. He looked to the front, where All Might was waiting. He decided to exit out the back. He was walking across the field towards the exit, then he saw a blonde guy with broad shoulders, blonde hair and a broad smile looking right at him. Fuck me. Who the fuck is this guy? Hey, aren't you Izuku Midoriya? The guy said as he approached. Izuku ignored him and kept walking. Hey, I was asking you a question. Keep walking. His foot hit the sidewalk, and a hand landed on his shoulder. Look, man, we just want to ask you a few questions. The blonde pressed. You pro? Izuku responded. Um? No, I am a first year. The guy flattering some as he answered. Then take your fucking hand off me before I report you. Go back to whoever sent you and tell them to fuck off too. Izuku said. Dude, why are you so much of a dick? The blonde said, seemingly genuinely confused. Izuku shrugged the blonde's hand off and kept walking. Hey, I didn't say you could go. The blonde said, hey all might, he is at the back of the school and walking down the street. He called into his phone. Izuku took a few more steps, then there was a sudden gust of wind standing in front of him was all might. Not the skeletal man but the actual all might. Look, Midoriya, I tried to do this politely, but now I must insist it. Izuku raised his eyebrow. Insist. Under what law are you detaining me? Listen, Midoriya, there is more going on here than you possibly could know. 
Just answer a few questions, and we can set this aside. How do you think this will end all might you and Junior attack me in the street? I don't care that you feel bad about what you said. I don't care that you want to hear some explanation. So either you move out of my way, or I call the cops. Izuku threatened. What will you do when they ask you questions then, young mid-warrior? All Might retorted. I updated my registry and my identification. I'm golden. Now if you would excuse me. Izuku told him. How will you explain harassing a minor? I don't think so. He went to reach out for Midoriya again. The blonde behind him started to sink into the ground. Izuku surrounded himself with his telekinesis creating a barrier. Time was slowing. He grabbed All Might's hand as it reached for him. The other started to emerge from the ground, and Izuku wrapped him in a bubble. All Might looked down at him, his eyes beginning to burn. Well, sorry Momo. Then his phone rang. His phone floated out of his pocket in front of his face. Well, speak of the devil. He released his physical hold of All Might and used his telekinesis on the other, as he struggled to tighten his grip. I will take this call, if you can behave, I will consider answering two questions. If you agree to this, nod your head. All Might saw his struggling protege and could feel the immense force on his arm. It would be a tough fight if this were Midoriya's true capability with his quirk. All Might nodded. Izuku. Hello, this is Izuku Midoriya. Momo. Well hello Izuku Midoriya, this is Momo Yeoi Rosu. She giggled how was your test today? Did you pass? Izuku. I did. Can I please call you back in just a few minutes? I need to sign some paperwork. Momo. Sure, call me back. I want to hear about your day. Izuku. I promise. Click. Izuku released the younger blonde tossing him back a little bit. He then released All Might. Look All Might, you get two questions. And after that, leave me alone, you and your sidekick. Hey, who do you think you are talking to, ass? All Might held up his hand, shutting up this protege. Do you think you can take us both, Midoriya? Is it your first question? Izuku replied calmly. No. Hurry this up, I have a beautiful woman waiting for my call. Said anger still present at the edges of his voice. How did you get this new body? I was born again. All Might did not like the answer, Izuku sounded smug, All Might slowly tensed his muscles. Were you approached by someone named All for One? No. Izuku went to step around All Might, but All Might be moved in front of him again. Look, I answered your questions. Now either let me pass, or we will each have a bad day. Are you threatening me? All Might said in an intimidating whisper. What? No, never, but, he pointed to a few people aiming their camera phones at them. If you pull this shit again, I will have to threaten you. He then started smiling broadly. Wow, All Might thank you for giving me an autograph, I mean golly gee wow. You are my favorite hero ever. I look up to you so much. Izuku stepped around and started walking away. Were you going to fight All Might? Jean asked. If I had to, I didn't want to. I may dislike him now. But he was my idol for a long time. And he did well, he did what was needed at the time. But a symbol of peace is not required anymore. Then what is needed? Change. Hey, Momo, you would never guess who I ran into when I left the school. Momo Yeoi Rosu. Momo was spending time with Mei on Saturday. They were in Mei's workshop, she was mostly chatting, feeling giddy, and overall riding an emotional high that had started last week, was reset Thursday, and would be again on Sunday. She swung her feet like a child, while Mei adjusted to her latest baby. So, you two a couple yet? Mei asked, not looking up. We haven't talked about it. I mean, I practically jumped his bones in the library. Oh, my goodness, does that make me a loose woman? Does he think poorly of me now? Momo said suddenly worried. Oh my god, that is the funniest shit I've heard. No, Momo, you are a woman who finds a man attractive. And with a body like yours, I am sure he loves it. May reassured her friend. Momo blushed. If he is only interested in my body, he is doing a great job of not overplaying that hand. Sounds like it. May laughed. So, is it ready? Momo asked. Yes. Momo stepped off her stool and approached a chain tugging it to open the skylight. May grabbed her baby and tossed it up, dragonfly-like wings sprouted as it hovered, a camera lens for eye opening up. Yes, step one, May said. Now, does step two work? Momo said in a teasing tone. Oh, ye of little faith, May said confidently. Isn't this version 22? Momo questioned. 28, but who's counting? May replied with a shrug. Aside to you. May walked over to her laptop, tapped a few keys, and it vanished. Yes, it works. Simply superb, May, Momo said, stepping back. Now, let's take a look. The Super Stealth Spy Camera Mark 28, or the SSSC, took off. The light refraction could have been better put. It should be good enough. Momo made her way over to Mei and her laptop, as the camera gave them an aerial view. Momo pointed to the screen. There's the van. Yay, it's the same one I noticed last week. So, what now? Let's gather evidence, then we will handle this my way. Calling daddy? Of course, she giggled. All might need some help. He stood before the UA door for five minutes before knocking. Today he had not gone to plan. 
Either Izuku Midoriya was lying that day on the roof about not having a quirk, or something else was happening. Midoriya displayed a rather masterful control of his power, and seemed to have the strength to make the prospect of a fight less clear-cut than All Might would like. Welcome, Tashi, the little rat, bear, thing. Hello Nezu, I need your help. Oh, did your protege get in trouble again? No, Miro is a fine passionate quick learner, but brilliant nonetheless. Then what can I help you with? Izuku Midoriya. Interesting, Tashi, tell me more, and please don't leave anything out. The rodent smiled as he uttered the word. All Might took a deep breath and began telling Nezu everything he knew about the boy, how he had first encountered him, their recent interaction today, and the massive changes Izuku had gone through. Nezu asked tons of questions long into the night before All Might excused himself and went home to sleep. All Might. All Might awoke in a luxurious bed, he was in his bolt-up form, his arms and legs bound to the corners. He was wrapped in silk sheets, and sitting on his abdomen dressed in a black leather corset, was Jean. Hello All Might, or do you prefer Toshinori Yagi? He struggled against the restraints, he struggled to maintain his control. The feeling he had when he first met her was crashing over him. He didn't have much in the way of romantic experiences. Indeed, nothing like this when he wasn't the one in control. It was getting hard to control his arousal. Naughty boy, she smirked. Jean, release me. No, I don't think I will. Besides, it won't do you any good. Notice anything. His mind raced, she was sitting on his stomach. There was no scar, no hole, nothing. This isn't real. Jean tapped her temple. All in your mind, sweet thing. We are going to have a little conversation about Izuku. If you know what is best for you, you will back off. I don't respond well to threats. How about promises? You can't fight me here, no one can. So, you have two choices. One, I just shut off your mind. Meaning you die. Or two, we can talk. He tried to struggle, his mind raced. If this was a mental landscape, then she was indeed powerful, the level of details told him that. It was possible that she wasn't bluffing. Fine, speak. He relented. You are going to leave Izuku alone. If you keep pushing, you will put your world in jeopardy. If you go and show up at his date today and ruin him forming his anchor, you will start something that doesn't need to be. Anchor? None of your business. Let me help you with your fears for a moment. All for one has nothing to do with him. I am the one that handled his rebirth. He wants nothing to do with one for all. He wants to be a hero. If you keep interfering, you are going to fuck this up. How can I trust any of this? What do you mean you handled his rebirth? All Might asked. When you left him on that roof, he was broken and destroyed. I rebuilt him, I brought him back. She said simply. What is your quirk? Doesn't matter. You are harassing him because of his quirk. I activated it. I unlocked it for him. His telekinesis was there, just waiting. The body. An associate of mine. He owed me a favor. We just were able to accelerate his growth and development. Why him? Because I see the potential that no one else did. Even you, number one. How can I believe you? Listen all might you have your protege, and I have mine. You would go all out to protect yours, and I will burn this world down for mine. Just watch him respectfully and objectively. He will be a hero the likes your world has never seen. If I don't. She sighed. We can go in circles for eternity. All Might was looking into Izuku's mind. He was there cleaning a beach. Not for fame and glory, but for an elderly couple and a wish. There was no malice, no ill thoughts. He was thinking of his date, feeling giddy and excited. He then felt Izuku's mind shift to All Might, showing that his thoughts were anger and annoyance. Not murderous intent. Anger at All Might for not having just told him yes, he could be a hero. Irritation at their encounter yesterday. A worry of a repeat today. Now it is up to you to believe in that or not. I am going to release you, and you will wake up in your bed. I am asking you to have faith in him, that same faith you denied him months ago. You, a quickless boy, told another quickless boy that he couldn't have the same dream as you. When the ability to do so was in your hands. You were looking for a successor. If you had bothered to look into him, you would have seen what I saw. Instead, you cast him aside. This is the last time we chat in such a friendly manner All Might. All Might awoke in his room. A warm sensation lingered on his abdomen and a slightly shameful erection. Second date. Izuku was early to the exhibit. He was excited about the traveling exhibition of ancient pre quirk art. To say that was all he was excited about would be a lie. Momo. He could be going to an exhibit of trash found behind an unknown restaurant, but it would be sublime if it were with Momo. He has spent time thinking about this. Sure, she was beautiful, but when he first saw her, he knew he had to see her again. She captivated him. He fought gorgeous women in his training, but none of them compared. Truth be told, he felt dumb. Love at first sight. His heart skipped a beat when she would text a call. His dreams one of her were the best. He saw the familiar car pull up, and then he saw her. 
She was wearing a black skirt with an emerald green blouse that fluttered in the light breeze, black sandals, some simple but love gold bracelets, earrings, and a diamond pendant necklace. His heart thumped against his chest. His brain almost went blank before he raised his arm so she could see him. She saw him staring at her before he signaled to her. She let her eyes drink him as she approached, dark green dress shirt, two buttons undone, rolled sleeves, gold watch, black slacks, simple black shoes. The shirt was just the right amount of tight. Her heart fluttered as they came together. As they hugged, she heard him whisper sublime as he gave her a light kiss on her lips. Electricity. They intertangled their hands as they walked to the entrance. The exhibit was relatively quiet today. It was perfect. They walked hand in hand through the exhibits, taking in these pre-quirk masters, Van Gogh, Da Vinci, Klimt, Botticelli, and Vermeer. They didn't notice anyone else, they walked and talked in whispers, gazing at the paintings, stealing kisses, laughing at simple jokes. They strolled through the gardens and stopped to sit on a bench, shoulder to shoulder, heads resting on each other, holding each other's hand. Some older couples would pause and look at the two young lovebirds giving each other knowing smiles. As they walked away, they would reminisce about those more youthful days. She broke the silence. Izuku, this week has been magical. So magical that I am afraid that I am about to wake up and find it has been a dream. What happens now? He gazed straight into her eyes. Momo, I don't know for sure, but I wanted to be with you. Momo Yeoi Rozu, will you be my girlfriend? Oh yes, Izuku, I couldn't think of much that would make me happier. Is it too fast? I honestly do not know, but if I let this moment slip away, I know that it would be one I would look back on with regret, regardless of where my life went. Good, I know. I feel the same. With that, they kissed, it was tender and electric and their official kiss. Though hundreds, if not thousands, would come later, only a handful would rank against this one. I know this lovely restaurant near here. Would you care to join me? She asked. Lead the way. Lanchenter. She led him to Lanchenter, it was a French restaurant. They were given a seat in the corner at a request. He looked at the menu, he was momentarily confused when something just clicked, and he could read it. Speaking, it was a different story. Thankfully Momo was just fine. She giggled and helped him pronounce his order. The lighting was lovely, providing this magical feel. She settled herself and looked him in the eye. How are your parents going to react, Izuku? She asked. Honestly, if I even talked to them, I probably wouldn't bring it up. He said, wondering how she would respond. Why? She said with a slight head tilt in confusion. We do not talk. My dad has been gone so long that I couldn't even tell you what he looks like if it wasn't for the pictures my mom had. My mom his voice trailed off. I am sorry Izuku. It was not my intention to cause you distress. She said worriedly. No, Momo, it is okay. I had a difficult time as a child, my quirk didn't manifest till my accident. So for most of my life, I was quirkless. Momo extended her hand to him, he took it gratefully. She knew of the discrimination that the quirkless of their society experienced. Most would move to small towns with other quirkless and try to live their lives. Unfortunately, they were a target for villains as they were easy pickings. Any town fortunate enough to have a hero usually they were not the kind of hero you would want being your sole protection. I wanted to be a hero more than anything, but I had this friend. He wasn't really a friend we used to be before his quirk manifested, then he just had the whole my quirk is the best, so that means I am better than everyone. We wanted to be heroes when we were young, but according to him, when my quirk never manifested, I was just useless. He would call me Deku and bully me constantly, then his lackeys would join in. No one did anything. It put a huge strain on my mom and I's relationship. I still wanted to be a hero. She wanted me to join quirkless groups. Look into moving to one of those towns after school. She didn't support you. I am so sorry Izuku, it must have been hard to have a dream without anyone telling you that you could do it. It was terrible, to be honest. Eventually, we were just strangers that lived in the same place. She had enough and moved to live with my father, to work things out with him. But I could tell she wasn't going to come back. So it was just me. Then I had my accident. She just held his hand, fighting back tears and the desire to take him in his arms and hold him. Tell him it will all be okay. Some mental block was withholding back my quirk. Maybe it was me just thinking I was so worthless for so long. But then it manifested, I trained it every chance and started working out. Hit a major growth spurt. And then I met you. Momo, I don't know how to say this, but as soon as I saw you, it was just I don't even have the words. It took her a moment to compose herself. I promise Izuku, you will never be alone again. I know you can be a hero. We will do it together. She rose from her seat and leaned across the table. He did the same and shared a brief kiss. Thank you Momo. I used to want to be a hero like All Might. I was a huge fan, but I had time to think after my accident and realized I needed to do it differently. What do you mean? Our hero society is stagnant. All Might is the number one and the symbol of peace. No one tries anymore, except maybe Endeavor, but he is damn rough. He has no chance. Too many heroes are busy making commercials or being celebrities that they are not even heroes. 
There are good ones out there, but no one pays attention. Everything is quirk-centered, your power quirk or lack thereof dictates your lot in life. When quirks manifested, everything shifted. It was all about quirks, not about society. I want to make things better for everyone. Change the world and push for people to advance. Not just hero society but all of it. Why haven't we moved beyond the planet? I don't know colonize the moon or Mars. We have so many people with so many different quirks and abilities. Do you mean we can't get together and figure this out? There was no more pain in his voice, it was rich with passion. It spoke to her. I agree, I want to help people. My parents want me to take over the company, but I want to improve people's lives, Melissa and May are the same. They want to change the world with their inventions. Not just hero society but the world. Improve the quality of life for everyone. Change the world. I want to change the world. Then let's change the world together. All four of us. But my parents want me to take over the company. Then do it. Take it over, hire May and Melissa, and let them change the world. Give them the freedom and resources. I would love to be by your side. We could lead the call for change together. You're right. If the company is mine, then I can do what I want. But the board may fight back against me. Then we will fight back against the board. We have four years to figure it out. You are brilliant, I am no dummy, from what you are saying, May and Melissa are intelligent, and who knows whom we will meet at UA. We may find even brighter people, and there is also the business course. We will have access to some of the best and brightest people in the world. So, what do you say, Momo? Want to change the world with me? She smiled. The future wasn't so dark for the first time in a long time. She saw a way out. It was part of youthful ignorance, but she wanted that future her, Izuku, Melissa, May, and whomever else they picked up along the way. After that, they just began an exuberant conversation about changing the world. About their future. They ended their date in a park again. Her sitting side sat along his lap as they attempted to see how long they could hold their breath. 